Okay, so welcome everyone and, and thank you for joining and especially thank you for Georg and, and the whole team of the Erlangen um, National HPC Group in Germany for showing us their tools uh, Liquid and Asakar. And Georg, you're ready to go. Thanks a lot, Eva. Thanks again for having us and the opportunity to trans, uh, transfer our knowledge here to you about liquid Osaka and sparse matrix vector multiplication. We try to find a combination of topics that is probably interesting to many of you. Um, but first of all, let me introduce ourselves. Uh, we are part of the newly founded, newly established uh, uh, National High Performance Computing Center at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg. We are one of eight newly established themed centers. And from our logo, you might infer already what the theme is. It is atomic, atomistic simulations. Um, we complement the three federal centers at Garching, Jülich, and Stuttgart, which you might have heard of. They form the Gauss Center for Supercomputing. Um, so um, we're just in the, in the process of establishing this new center. We're not finished yet, so a lot of work to do. Um, here's our research focus. Um, we're mostly focused on performance engineering, performance modeling, more specifically analytic performance modeling. And you see a little bit of that in this webinar. Uh, we also developed some performance tools, which you also will see some in this webinar. Uh, also hardware aware building blocks for sparse linear algebra and stencils. And uh, there's also a group that does uh, research software engineering for high performance computing and data analytics. In the application side, especially where we um, care for our users, we are concentrated on atomistic simulations in life science and in material science. So this is the general setting um, we're, we're working in. As I said, we're just ramping up our activities, including the teaching. Uh, myself, I'm the head of training and support of the NHR Center. Uh, with me today are Jan Laupelmann, Christy Alapat, and Thomas Gruber, who are all PhD students and who all did all the hard work in preparing uh, this webinar. So I hope we can live up to your expectations. So getting into it, um, we try to find a good balance between lecture and um, hands-on slash demo. So we try to intertwine uh, the lectures with demo and, and presentations so that uh, you don't get bored too easily with too many slides. Uh, so we start off with an introduction to uh, two, two important liquid tools, topology and affinity. Uh, then I will present a little bit of sparse matrix vector multiplication theory, especially how performance comes about for this important kernel. Uh, we have a hands-on demo on this. Then comes an introduction to Osaka, the open source architecture code analyzer, which is also developed at our center in a demo about that. And then after the break, I will present a uh, interesting high performance storage format for sparse matrices, which solve some of the problems um, of the standard storage format. And in the second part of the tools lectures, we will learn about liquid perf counter, how we can make sense of performance numbers using performance counters. And um, finally, in a demo, we will have an analysis of this new format in the context of sparse matrix vector multiplication. And if there's um, time at the end, Christy will present some loose ends, some, some stuff that you can do on top of what we present today as an outlook of, to, to what you might um, explore in the future. There's a website um, in our learning management system, Moodle. Uh, you can click on this link, so tiny.cc slash okami hackathon, and there you will find um, all the slides and also some supporting material for the hands-on. We will try to do the demos and the hands-on in a way so that we show you what we do and what the results are. And uh, if you want, you can just tag along. You can check out the code and do whatever the presenter does to the code and then also ask questions if you need to. Okay, so the link to these materials is also in the chat. Um, good, so this concludes my very quick introduction. And without further ado, I'm handing over to Thomas Gruber, who will give you an introduction to liquid topology and liquid pin. Thomas. Hello, everybody. So I'm switching the screen. Um, is my presentation now visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Gruber. I'm the main developer of the Liquid Tool Suites. 
uh, suite. Um, and this is like the, the first part, like the basic introduction, um, how to get some knowledge about the system and to control where the application is running. Um, we need these tools for uh, node level performance engineering mostly. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there how you get like node information and control the affinity. Uh, most of those tools are known by you probably. Um, so HW lock is quite big when it comes to topology uh, things, but also NUMA CTL for the memory domain stuff. Um, runtime profiling uh, is, is, there are a lot of tools like Perf and the HPC toolkit, Intel amplifier. Um, that some of them are not available on Okami, of course, because it's a different architecture, um, but things like perf and, and gprof and so on are uh, supported. Um, when it comes to performance analysis, uh, most tools based on the Puppy uh, interface and uh, Linux perf. Um, Liquid perf counter is somewhat uh, different or can somehow use those. Um, but also has a different way to access everything. Um, and then we have a micro benchmarking. Um, or most of you probably know the stream benchmark. Um, we have a, an own benchmark for streaming like kernels um, and all these kernels are written in assembly. As you can see, we, we placed most, uh, most of the stuff listed here is also covered by one of the um, liquid tools. Um, today we focus on liquid topology and liquid pin in the first part and liquid perf counter in the second part. So liquid tool suite, liquid stands for like I knew what I'm doing. Um, it's developed since 2009 by a colleague of us, um, Jan Eitzinger, previously uh, Trivik. Um, we have some videos um, on, on YouTube, so like introductional videos. Um, you can take a look at uh, mostly like topology and pin is covered there. Uh, perf counter is not yet ready um, to publish. It's completely open source and developed at previously RZE, um, now NH NHR at FAU. And all the code, source code and information, wiki and so on is in the GitHub repository. So it's a set of command line tools for Linux. It's easy to install. So in most cases, it's a make, make install things. Um, works with the standard Linux kernel. So no kernel modules are required. Um, on Okami, it uses the, the perf kernel interface to get the, the data, um, so the performance data. It's simple and clear to use. I mean, that's like biased. Um, we, we try to get the uh, user interface uh, handy, um, but some uh, have problems with it. Uh, it supports most of the x86 CPUs, but also like ARM8, like Okami, um, Power9, and NVIDIA GPUs. So here in the bottom is a set of tools. Um, it's not complete, um, but it's like the same we, we had on the last slide. The only new one is Liquid Perf Counter, uh, Liquid MPI Run which is like a combination of liquid pin and liquid perf counter for MPI plus X applications. So the first thing when you, when you access a new machine is you wanna get some knowledge about the topology, how does the system look like, where the threads are, how are they distributed on the, on the sockets, on the dies and the NUMA domains. Um, and for that, um, we provide liquid topology, which gives you a, a one glimpse overview about the architecture. Um, in, the, in, the, in the top, you have some basic information about the system. The, the A64FX does not provide an own specific CPU name on x86 systems and so on. This is filled with the official brand name. <clears throat> and afterwards, sorry, you have the hardware threat topology, which shows all the uh, the threads in the list, like, like here from zero to 47, that's the uh, numbering used by the operating system. Um, and here we have some additional um, information like the SMT thread ID, which is of course zero for all, uh, because uh, for all A64FX, because there is no SMT, but you have the core numbers, you have the die number, um, the socket number and so on. 
Um, if the CPU is available in your CPU set, um, it's marked with a star. Um, and then we have a list of all the sockets and, and the uh, CPU IDs on it. Um, as a remark, uh, the Okami system announces itself as a four socket system, but basically it's a, it's a four die system. So it's a single socket with four dies. Um, this is currently not exported by the operating system on Okami. That's why it's shown like this. Um, if, if you have a more recent kernel, it would use the die ID instead um, on a single socket. So, so afterwards, so yeah. Tom, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, to interrupt this early, sorry. But I, <laughs> I, I was always curious. That, that in the end, you're, you're using information available from the operating system. You're not having to go in and poke around the hardware yourself. That's true, yeah. OK. Yeah. So basically, Liquid uses HW lock under the hood. Um, um, if it's available, if not, it, it, I'm trying to read everything out of the proc and SysFS. Mm -hmm. um, and on x86, there's a quite old lookup method using the CPU ID instruction. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to get all the information and I'm, I'm adding like some static information, like the caches, which are not provided by the system on A64FX. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, I have added like static information to Liquid, Liquid yes. Okay, so you have your own little mini database as well. Okay. Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah, some, some data structures where I can put in information like this in here. Yeah, so here you see the, the level one and level two cache um, with 64 kilobyte for the uh, level one cache. Um, each core has a distinct L1 cache and the L2 cache is eight megabyte in size and shared by all 12 cores of a, um, of a die or a CMG. Um, and in the end, you have the, the NUMA topology. Um, so on, our, on the Okami system, you have four NUMA domains and um, you get the free space and the distances between these um, like quite similar to the NUMA CTL uh, dash dash hardware um, output. Yeah. Um, if there is GPU support available, you get also like the GPU topology afterwards. So this is not listed here. Just not the scope of this talk. Um, so if you know about the, the topology now, you, you probably want to um, you control how your application um, is scheduled on the different CPU cores. And for that, um, so you call, control the process and thread affinity. Um, for this, we have liquid pin, um, quite simple tool. There's also an introductional video from a colleague of mine. Um, here's some motivation why it is important. So um, Georg ran the um, stream triad um, on Okami um, and there you see a high fluctuation um, in the, in the, the bandwidth um, you can achieve from, from the system. So uh, quite a lot of min max um, values in between. Um, you should see the median here. Um, here you see how it is how the system is um, looks like in a schematic way. Um, so if we, um, this one is the, the, the filling of the first CMG and afterwards we, we get some fluctuation. Um, so if we pin that um, with a compact pinning, um, it looks like this. You see there's also the error bars, but they are basically not existent. So there's no fluctuation in. Um, this is the common picture. If you do compact pinning, so you fill the first socket first, and then you, you add more threads uh, in the other CMGs, um, you get this linear, linear scaling behavior. Um, there are reasons. So, so as, you, as you can see there, there are reasons to control the affinity. Um, as we see, the, the, we eliminate the performance variation, but also we make use of architectural features like the L1 cache. Um, if we move the thread away, it gets uh, cache trashing. So it has to reload the data again into the new um, L1 cache. And also if we have too many threads on a, on a single resource, um, um, we can get resource contention to avoid that we can um, scatter the threads and um, have more performance. So on the last slide, I've shown the, the compact pinning and this linear scaling. 
um, just an interlude why it is like that or why it looks like that. So in the first socket, we, we simply scale like, like normal and fill the, the first memory controller with, with work. Um, and afterwards, we add single threads which work on a distinct memory controller and are not, um, don't have the contention as the other 12 threads. So that's why you get this linear scaling um, forced by the implicit barrier in the end of the OpenMP parallel do. So here, these are waiting in barriers and the more you add, the less this, this fraction gets. Um, yeah. Here's a description of that. Um, so we are waiting for the speeders here. So the other ones on the other sockets. Yeah. Um, the, con to control the thread and process affinity, they are highly OS dependent system calls. So they are different on like OS X and, and Linux and so on. Um, on Windows, you have the set thread affinity mask. On Linux, you have shared set affinity. So if you want to do it yourself, um, but there's also like more sophisticated um, APIs like HW lock, which does that. Um, and there are, of course, these common tools um, that are installed with most Linux of, um, ecosystems like Taskset and Numa CTL, um, which don't do real pinning. They just reduce the CPU set, but they don't force single application threads to run on a single CPU. Um, in order to do that with OpenMP, for example, you can, do, you can use these OMP places, OMP proc bind variables. Um, but this is like, yeah, it's not a, for me, it's not a handy way to, to specify whatever you want to run on. Uh, you can also use the, the slow embed scheduler, which distributes the threads itself. Um, and there is also affinity awareness in, in MPI libraries like OpenMPI and Intel MPI. Um, so what is, what is the difference to, to, to the other tools for liquid pin? Um, so as the other tools, it, it does not touch the code. Um, so you can run your binaries that are dy must be dy dynamically linked um, with this tool. And what it does, it, it overloads some um, internal functions um, to pin the threads as soon as they are created. Um, we support p threads, then the, all the OpenMP runtimes, but also more like the exotics like Silk and um, TBB and so on are also um, handled properly. Um, <clears throat> in order to specify which cores to use, um, you can of course use the physical um, core IDs as specified by the operating system uh, like this. So zero to three and so columns, uh, column separated list, but you can also use like ranges. Um, the, whatever you specify, so if the user specifies this variable like OMP num threads, um, liquid pin does not override it. Um, it accepts whatever the user uh, has said explicitly. So in this case, it will only start four threads pinned to like the first four um, CPUs in this set. Um, this is this is quite nice. Um, if you have checked the operating uh, the, the topology before and marked down which CPU is, CPU IDs you want to use, um, but there is a simpler way to do that. Um, Liquid defines so-called thread groups or affinity groups, um, which helps you to specify wherever an application should run on. So here, in that case, we want um, eight physical. Uh, we want to have eight threads on the socket zero. Um, this would be the, the second last level cache segment. Um, so we group threads based on like their logical entity in the, which they are in. Um, and with this, so um, you can like logically use indexing in, this, in these sets. Um, so here's another example with some uh, small ASCII output. Um, so if we specify like here, the, uh, we wanna have four threads on the socket, um, it uses the first physical um, cores. On Okami, this doesn't matter because there is no SMT. So it was, would use like zero, one, two, three, four, um, 
and so on. Um, on SMT systems, it skips the virtual um, threads, so the SMT threads. Um, you can combine these uh, selection syntaxes with an add. Um, you can have multiple of those um, and, and can combine them. So here we want to have four threads on the first socket and four threads on the second socket. Um, here's a short picture um, how these thread domains are named. So we have the end domain, which is the whole node. Um, and is used like if you don't specify anything for a liquid pin, it uses the whole node to pin the threads. Um, there's the socket, so S for socket, uh, socket zero, socket one, and so on. Uh, for NUMA domains, we have M, so you can um, place the threads based on the NUMA um, topology and C for the outer level cache group. Um, in the newest release, we have a new domain DX um, for the CPU dies. Um, so um, this is a, like a new domain type um, and you can um, use those for, for pinning as well. The expressions is, um, is, uh, is a way of function-based um, specification, which, which thread, threads to use. Um, I don't cover that here, you can look at it. Um, it's quite handy for systems with a, with a lot of um, CPUs. Um, here's an example how to run it. So just the output. Um, so we run the basic screen benchmark, pin it on the first four cores of the socket zero. And this is the, the blue output is created by liquid pin as soon as the application starts and uh, starts some threads. So the, the main application thread is pinned to CPU zero. So the first one here in the set, and then the, the other threads that are started are pinned um, round robin to the to the other set. So if we start if we start a fourth thread now, um, it would be pinned to zero again. So some round robin scheme. Yeah, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, we go over to the more theoretical part with SPMB. So, so Thomas, when it comes to thread pinning, I've always had. Uh... I'm always curious, um, I mean, uh, clearly where the thread is executing and where memory is being allocated are, are, are distinct concepts, but ultimately I guess some OS policy is controlling this, but we've also seen with the Fujitsu compiler that um, it, it has its own separate uh, mechanisms for controlling where memory is allocated, no matter where your thread is. So how, uh, how should we think about these things with liquid pin? So um, normally we assume that there's a first touch policy, which is not valid for the Fujitsu compiler in all cases, um, as you have mentioned. Um, so there you can specify with uh, command line options if you want to have a different memory policy for your application. So if you want to have this interleaved memory policy, which places the, the memory interleaving on all NUMA domains, um, you can specify that on the command line before starting an application. Um, I'm not 100% sure whether it covers all the Fujitsu cases yet. Um, I haven't, uh, most of this is controlled with environment variables on Fujitsu um, and I might miss one or two environment variables at the moment. Okay, very good, thank you. And the, um... You indicated you're intercepting the p-thread calls, and I must admit, I must admit when I've uh, mean manually binding threads, you, one ends up making a thread, and then uh, once the thread is created, uh, binding it to something. And I, I always end up being a bit concerned that thread starts executing somewhere, allocates its stack, or touches some pieces of it, and then immediately gets bound somewhere else. So, how do you navigate that? Well, yeah, I mean the the if, if you apply pinning yourself, then of course using liquid pin is like overkill. Um, but um, the application is of course allowed to move the threads around wherever it wants to move it around. No, 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 I, I guess I was miscommunicating. I was saying, uh, I, uh, I was trying to learn how you, you, you seem to pull something off that I don't know how to do. So I was wondering how, how you managed to really make sure the stack is where you want it. 
so I we, think the so code we, the code of the thread doesn't start executing um, until after the pinning has taken place. So the thread yeah. is ah, okay. Since we're intercepting okay. the create call, there's no code executed within the thread before the um, the pinning has taken place. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. But if you want to know, I, I can show you the the link to the source code. So that's all available. Yeah, that would be cool. Thanks. Okay. So. All right. So um, we'll have a little demo about the pin and topology tools later in the first hands-on, but I will go on right away now with some theory on sparse matrix vector multiplication. I hope that those of you who are not dealing with sparse matrices on a daily basis uh, can bear with us. And I hope it can, can motivate that this is a really important kernel. And it is, it's responsible for um, a major part of compute cycles on many supercomputers worldwide. Uh, so it's really useful um, to think about what, what, what's a, what are performance limiters of sparse matrix vector multiplication and how can we understand its performance. Um, so it's key ingredient in many algorithms. Um, matrices are sparse in many contexts because they describe systems which have sort of local interactions. And you describe that best um, with a sparse matrix in which most of the entries are zero. And of course, uh, since these matrices tend to be really large, like dimension 10 to the nine or something, you never want to store all zeros. You always want to store the non-zeros only in a way that um, is efficient uh, as a storage format and also makes it possible to run any algorithms in which a sparse matrix is involved effectively. And um, that's what we're trying to describe here. <clears throat> Uh, a couple of um, parameters that are important in this context is NR, the number of rows of the matrix, uh, NNZ, the number of non-zeros, all entries that are non-zero, and NNZR, this is the number of non-zeros per row, actually the average number of non-zeros per row, because the, per row, the number of non-zeros could vary a lot depending on the, on the application case, of course. So NNZR is always the average number of non-zeros per row. And of course, if you want to multiply a matrix with a vector, which is the core component of many sparse algorithms, then you can deal with the left-hand side if you do it row by row, because you know if you go from memory to linear fashion, left-hand side is never a problem. And if you can store the matrix in an efficient format, you also could make it possible that the matrix data is accessed in a cache-friendly way, touching each element exactly once. However, for the right-hand side, some indirect addressing is usually required, and depending on the sparsity pattern of the matrix, uh, this access to the right hand side may become really erratic. And it's really hard to predict um, how much data traffic, for example, it causes. And we'll, we'll come to that, we'll come to ways of modeling and describing that. Okay, so um, for, for large problems, if the matrix doesn't fit into any cache, sparse matrix vector multiplication is always memory bound. Okay, so we expect to see the typical saturation effect on NUMA domains as we approach the NUMA domain barrier. If the matrix is in memory, then we have this typical saturation behavior uh, for sparse matrix vector multiplication. On the plus side, it's usually easily parallelizable in shared memory. In distributed memory, not so easy, but it's doable. It's well understood how this is done. And the main um, concerns here are load balancing. And also in the case of distributed memory, the communication overhead, which we're not going to deal with today. Um, the data storage format, so how you put the non-zeros into memory to make it possible to, to execute the SPMV operation effectively is really crucial. And uh, the standard format, which I'm going to demonstrate on the next slide is CRS, the compressed row storage. Um, but there are also many other formats and we'll also introduce one later today. <clears throat> And typically, the optimal format depends on the compute architecture, whether you're on a standard multi-core CPU, on a vector processor, or on a GPU, so, which uh, doesn't make the whole issue um, simpler to deal with. So I know that many of you know this already, but I also know many of you don't. So let me just take a minute and um, describe to you the CRS matrix storage scheme. We need it later for dealing or for describing the performance uh, properties of this operation, so bear with me for a minute. So this is our sparse matrix here. In this example, it's coincidentally, it's symmetric, but it doesn't have to be. So prerequisite for the CRS storage scheme, we wanna squeeze out all the, all the zeros. So what we do is you write all the rows 
one after the other. And we just omit all the white space, all the zeros. Now the, all the non-zeros are written consecutively in this array we call val. So the values of the matrix are stored. Now, of course, a lot of information has been lost. And in order to do anything with these entries, we have to be able to reconstruct the original structure. And the first thing we need is for each entry of the matrix, we need to memorize where was it, uh, where was it located um, uh, across the matrix. So what was its original column index? So this is Fortran indexing. The first entry was in column one, the second column two, three, five, and so on. So we have one additional integer for every floating point value in the matrix. Now this is okay. This lets us um, get to the um, appropriate right-hand side vector entry that we have to marry with the current vector uh, matrix element to do the um, fused multiply add. But we still have to know where to store it on the left side. And to do that, we need, we'll still need a third data structure, the row pointer. The row pointer array holds, indi holds index, uh, indices, uh, integers. And it, uh, these pointers point to the starting indices of the rows in the matrix. So the first row starts at index one, the second row starts at index five, third row starts at index eight, 12, and so on. And with these three arrays, we can reconstruct the whole matrix. We don't want to do that. Of course, we want to use these three arrays and do the matrix vector multiplication on the fly using these data structures, not reconstructing the full matrix, of course. So here's the code, it's simple enough. The outer loop is a loop over the rows, one to NR. The inner loop goes over the non-zeros of a row from row pointer of I to row pointer of I plus one minus one. Okay, we're only traversing uh, a loop that has a length of as many non-zeros there are in the current row. And then it's really similar to a dense matrix vector multiplication kernel. We update the left-hand side, C of I, um, plus val of J, the current value, the current entry of the matrix, times the right-hand side. In order to get the right-hand side entry for the current matrix entry, we have to index the right-hand side vector B with the column index array. Okay, that's it. It's very simple. It's deceivingly simple um, because it has an extremely rich and complicated performance um, phenomenology. Uh, on the plus side, it's easy to parallelize with OpenMP. It's a matter of a minute to write the OpenMP uh, directives here. Um, the only thing you might come across is the load balancing problem because of course the matrix could be ill-structured so that um, it's quite top heavy, for example, the top half of the matrix might have a lot of non-zeros and the bottom half might have very few non-zeros. And if you do a standard static scheduling, you end up in a load imbalance. So you might wanna choose an appropriate schedule here. Okay, but apart from that, it's really simple to parallelize. Okay, now let's look at performance measurements and see whether our expectations about the simple operation are actually fulfilled. So as I mentioned, we expect saturating performance for large problems that do not fit into any cache. So what we see here is performance versus number of cores on a, a single socket of a Xeon Gold 6248. That's a Cascade Lake, Intel Xeon Cascade Lake CPU with 20 cores. We're ignoring SMT here, and we're running this with uh, one to 20 cores. The matrix we're using is called DLR1. It's from one of, one of our project partners. It has uh, 40 million non-zeros, so it's well beyond any, any cache size. The number of non-zeros per row is 143, and we use static scheduling. And we'll see later, this is a good matrix, okay? It has um, a good behavior. So this is the, the performance profile we get, performance versus number of cores. And as expected, it shows the typical saturation behavior that you also get with a, a simple streaming benchmark like stream. But there's questions here. Is this good or bad? Okay, could it be improved? Is there some kind of light speed for sparse matrix vector multiplication? Is, is this the limit? So this like I don't know, 17 gigaflops. Is this the limit I should expect on this machine for this matrix for this operation? Or could I do something to improve that? Okay. Could I probably change the matrix? Or is, is there a different matrix that shows a different behavior? Very important questions, and we'll cover some of the answers in this course. All right, so in order to approach this problem, we need uh, a couple of, uh, a little bit of um, knowledge about analytic performance modeling. And you may have come across the roofline model, and this is just one slide um, about the roofline model and how to derive useful upper performance limits. 
The roof line model is an optimistic performance model. It uses, a simplify, it uses simplifying assumptions towards the hardware and the software to come up with an upper limit for the performance of a loop. And this upper limit is P is given by the minimum of P max and BS over BC. Now in this formula, P max is the maximum theoretical performance of a loop. And this performance, this number assumes that all the data that the loop needs to process the data is already in the L1 cache. It's as close to the CPU as possible. Okay, so this P max value assumes that you're dealing with data that is very close to the computational units. The second part of the min function is this ratio BS over BC. BS is the maximum memory bandwidth. So how much data can you transfer over the memory bus per second? And BC is the only number, the only parameter that goes in that characterizes the code. So whatever code you're executing, it's always in a loop, remember? We're dealing with it on a loop by loop basis. Um, we characterize it by this number BC, and this is just the number of bytes I need to transfer over the memory bus divided by the number of flops I want to do. Okay, so it's like amount of traffic I need over the bottleneck divided by the amount of work I'm doing. Now in the literature, often you see the inverse of that, flops per byte, and it's called the computational intensity. BC, uh, the code band is just one over intensity. It's the same thing, just uh, reciprocal. We like to use BC because it, in practice, if you do real problems, it gives you the nicer numbers, okay? BC is often like six bytes per flop or 10 bytes per flop, whereas intensity is often 0 0.026 or something like that. So that's why we like to deal with BC. Okay, looking at the kernel for sparse matrix vector multiplication, if we wanna deal with Pmax first, we see this is the, the inner kernel of this operation. We load the value, we load the left-hand side, probably just once per, uh, once per row, we load the right-hand uh, right side and we load the column index. So we have at most four loads, probably fewer, one store, one multiply, and one add. And only, well, uh, there's very little work for a lot of data to be transferred, even between L1 cache and registers. So we come up with a hypothesis here that it is probably insignificant if you wanna look at the in-core performance Pmax, assuming everything comes from the L1 cache, this is probably limited by the amount of data the L1 cache can deliver to the computational units. And this is so much, this is terabytes per second, right? For a modern multi-core CPU. This is so much that, well, in this expression, usually the second factor, the second argument wins. This is the smaller one, okay? Usually I'm limited by main memory band. We'll see later if this assumption was justified, okay? But as a working hypothesis, it's quite good. And also for most, um, most CPUs, it's also a quite good assumption. Okay, so for the time being, for the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna assume that um, the bandwidth limitation is our only limitation. And why is the bandwidth limitation bandwidth divided by code balance? Well, the bandwidth is what the memory interface can deliver, bytes per second, gigabytes per second. In case of the A64FX, the memory bandwidth is the order of 800 something gigabytes per second. The code balance is the amount of data per flop that the kernel needs. So if I divide the memory bandwidth by the code balance, what I get as a result is something with a unit of flops per second, is how many flops I can do every second if the memory bandwidth is my bottleneck, okay? This is the whole thinking behind this ratio. Now, all we have to do is figure out what BC is for the SPMV kernel. Now let's do that. Here's our kernel again. Uh, on the right here, we see the data structures. <clears throat> so we have a double precision value array, integer, 32-bit uh, 30, integers for the column index and the row pointer. And we have double precision left-hand side and right-hand side vectors, okay? Now let's approach this from a bird's eye perspective. Okay, assuming the cache works perfectly, we at least we have to load the matrix once and the column index once, okay? And since both of these data structures are not reused in any way, so each element of val and each element of column index is used exactly once, there's one, uh, one contribution to the load traffic here that's for sure, and this is 12 times number of non-zeros. 12 bytes, eight bytes for the matrix entry, four bytes for the column index times number of non-zeros. This is the number of bytes I have to load anyway. Okay, matrix and column index. Um, 
Then there's the, uh, the purple stuff, the row pointer and the left-hand side. We have to load the left-hand side at least once because we need to update it. And we need to load the row pointer at least once. And the number of rows is NR. So that's four plus eight times NR. This is the traffic from row pointer and left-hand side loading. And then there is, um, I have to uh, load the right-hand side at least once, okay? Now the right-hand side has a length of NC, number of columns. I was implicit, implicitly assuming up to now that the matrix is square and we stick to that, but just for being exact, I'm putting the NC here, okay? So this is eight bytes times number of columns for the right-hand side. It may be that there's more traffic from the right-hand side. We'll come to that, okay? But at least we have to read it once. Now the store traffic is simple. Everything that has to go back as modified data back into memory is the modified left-hand side vector. And this is eight bytes times number of rows. All right, so this is the minimum traffic for this whole operation over the memory bus. And the total, total flop count is simple. It's just two times number of non-zeros because there's a multiply and an add per in a loop iteration. So this is our hypothesis for the minimum code balance of this operation. 12 times NNZ plus 20 times NR plus eight times NC, number of columns divided by number of non-zeros times two. Okay, so if you modify this a little bit, um, we can, can uh, just multiply with one over NNZ here, the numerator and denominator, and we end up with something very interesting. All that's left in the numerator is 12 without any other factor. And the other two factors in the numerator are 20 over NNZR and eight over NNZC. So we see immediately that if the number of non-zeros per row and or the number of non-zeros per column are large, and these two things become small, okay? Keep that in mind. It means that if these two terms become small, then this expression BC min approaches six bytes per flop. And it's evident that this is the least amount of traffic per flop that we have in this data structure if we do a matrix vector multiplication. So it's like the, the overall lower limit for any CRS-based sparse matrix vector multiplication. The minimum possible code balance is six bytes per flop. Um, accordingly, the maximum intensity is one over six flops per byte. Okay. Now let's take this a little further. We know that there's a little bit of right-hand side um, uncertainty here because we need this indirect access to the right-hand side. How do we deal with that? Okay, so this was a formula for the minimum code balance. And here we assume that the right-hand side vector of length um, NC only must be loaded once. Now, we're not quite sure about that. We're not sure whether it's really possible to only load the right-hand side each element once and then reuse it as often as necessary along a column and having it stay in cache as long as necessary. This is not guaranteed. So there may be, might be a little bit more traffic involved in the right-hand side, uh, in the loading the right-hand side, but we don't know how much. Okay? In simple cases, we might be able to predict that, but not in, in the general case. So what we do as good scientists is, uh, if we don't know something, we put in a fudge factor, a factor, a parameter that somehow quantifies the, um, this right-hand side access, and instead of one over non-zeros per column, we write a factor of alpha, okay? Now, alpha, if the right-hand side vector comes from memory, alpha must be at least one over number of non-zeros per column, okay? So it, it is for sure greater or equal than this. We don't know what the upper limit could be. And alpha times NNZZ, this is something that's bigger than one. This number tells us how often the right-hand side vector must be loaded. Okay, if we know alpha, we can multiply it by number of zeros per column, and then we know how often the right-hand side is, is reloaded. Now, from now on, we're gonna assume that uh, our matrices are square. So the number of zeros per column is the same as the number of zeros per row, okay? And number of columns is number of rows. So um, here in this expression for alpha, we have number of zeros per row from now on in the denominator. Okay, so that's our performance model. That's our code balance. The code balance, depending on alpha now, is six plus four alpha plus 10 over NZR bytes per flop. And alpha is the unknown factor. Now, since we don't know alpha, it's difficult to say something, but at least we could give it some 
we could give meaning to some boundary values for alpha. So what happens if alpha is zero? Alpha is zero means that by some magic, the right-hand side vector axis costs nothing. Okay, it's, there's no traffic connected con to that. And this means, for example, that we have this SPMV operation embedded into some algorithm, which makes it possible to reuse the right-hand side vector from the cache. So if the matrix is big enough to be in the memory, but the, the right-hand side is short enough to stay in the cache, this is not impossible, then alpha could be zero. Okay, this is not the, gen the general case, but it could happen. The, the, the optimum general case is when alpha is one over NZR. This means the right-hand side must be loaded exactly once, and this is the minimum traffic for the right-hand side. Now, alpha equals one is an interesting case. This happens if each time we access the right-hand side element, it has to be loaded from memory, okay? And this means basically we have no cache. There's no cache. Old school vector computers had no caches. So this was, this was like the model for, uh, for old vector computers. <clears throat> and then it could be that alpha is bigger than one. Okay, can anyone imagine when this can happen? And under which circumstances could alpha be bigger than one? So that each time I go to a right-hand side entry, I load it, but I get more than eight bytes. This is what that means on average, okay? Mm. Each right-hand side access costs more than eight bytes. Any ideas? Cash lines. Cache lines, very good. <laughs> if we have cache lines, then it could be, of course, if the sparsity pattern of the matrix is really bad, really evil, that uh, we touch a single element of the right-hand side, we get the full cache line, we use one element. And when we come back to that cache line to get something else from that cache line, it's already gone because something else has replaced it in the cache. And this means alpha could potentially be bigger than one. Okay, so let's assume we have gotten hold of this alpha by whatever means, then our target performance, our expected bandwidth bound performance is memory bandwidth divided by code balance, okay? Now, of course, this presupposes that the memory bandwidth can actually be achieved. This may or may not happen. We'll see that later in the hands-on. Now, the basic question is, can we predict the alpha? No, that's not possible in general. It's too complicated. Um, in simple cases, if the matrix is heavily block structured, for example, if it has very many dense blocks, or if the, um, if the matrix has a lot of straight, long straight bands and nothing else, you can do something um, similar to the analysis that we do with stencil algorithms, but in general, it's hard. However, we can turn the model around. Even if we can't determine alpha analytically, we might be able to measure it, or we could measure the code balance directly and learn something about the problem by using these insights we gain up to now and learn something about, about the problem by measuring the code balance. And measuring the code balance is actually quite simple. We have our model here again. So this is our alpha dependent code balance model. The measured code balance is just, well, I run it on, a, some, on some machine. I measure the data traffic that it causes on this machine by measuring the amount of cache lines that go back and forth between the memory and the chip and I divide by the amount of work, which is fixed. It's number of non-zeros times two flops. Okay, that's it. This is my measured code balance. So it's quite simple to get hold of this number and to compare it with the minimum number we can infer from the basic properties of the matrix. And by comparing these two numbers, we can learn a lot about the problem. So let's do that using a matrix that's in, um, in popular matrix collections, KKT power. We'll also use it later in the demo. <clears throat> this is um, run on a Sandy Bridge socket, but actually uh, the same numbers uh, emerge when you run it on A64FX as we checked. So this matrix has a number of non-zeros of 14.6 million non-zeros, and the number of non-zeros per row is 7.1. So it's rather skinny as sparse matrices go. So many sparse matrices have uh, more number of non-zeros per row. The minimum code balance, which means Assuming the minimum alpha, one over number of zeros per row is 7.97 bytes per flop for this matrix. So this is, it doesn't get lower than that. We know the overall lower limit for the code balance for SPMV in this format is six bytes per flop. In this case, it's eight for this particular matrix because it's so skinny. 
Okay, if number of zeros per row is not big, it's seven is not a big number. It means that these two expressions for alpha and 10 over n z r, they become significant. And they, um, they make the minimum code balance for this matrix eight instead of six. If we measure the, uh, the data traffic and we calculate the code balance from this measurement, we get 8.83. Okay. Now, what do we do with these numbers? We know this is the minimum possible code balance. The green one is the actual code balance as measured by a tool. And the ratio of these two is 1.11, okay? Which means, this is a very important number. It means that by not accessing the right-hand side in the optimal way, because we have to reload it more than once from memory, we get an overhead of 11% of memory traffic. That's an interesting number. Without this analysis, you wouldn't have gotten hold of this number, okay? So 11%. So whatever you do now, if you think this 11% is worth investing work, you might try, for example, to reorder the matrix to get the non-zeros closer to the diagonal, okay? To make the, the data access more cache friendly and get this number closer to one because this is your limit, okay? It doesn't get lower than one. So this is very important by measuring the code balance, we know now how much overhead the right-hand side vector um, has in this axis. Now, let's come back to the start. Uh, we didn't start with the KKT power matrix, which seems to be a little bit problematic. We started with a really benign matrix, a good matrix, DLR1, which has a number of non-zeros per row of 144, okay? Lots of non-zeros per row. So uh, from this number alone, if the structure is not really random, you could already infer that this is a good matrix. Now, how could we know? Um, this is on a Cascade Lake. The read-only memory bandwidth on this machine was 110 gigabytes per second. The best possible overall code balance for sparse matrix vector multiplication is six bytes per flop, which means SPMV cannot run faster than 18.3 gigaflops per second on this machine. Okay, this is the per socket light speed, 18.3 gigaflops. Now for DLR1, we have a non-infinite number of non-zeros per row, okay? 143.7, it's finite, not infinite, which gives us a light speed for DLR1 of 18 gigaflops. The actual minimum code balance is 6.13. Uh, 6 it's very close to six, okay? This is already a very good indication that, uh, good indication that something is really good about this matrix. So it's almost, it has almost got the minimum code balance and the maximum performance is 18 gigaflops. The measured performance is something like 17.2. So we're within 95% of the limit. We're done, okay? This matrix is good. This bar is the um, upper limit. It's even the, the overall upper limit for all matrices and we're within 95% of that. It's fine, okay? We're done. All right, this concludes the analysis of Spark matrix vector multiplication for the CRS format. Are there any questions? You indicated potential algorithmic changes. Have you gone on and looked at sort of uh, forming multiple products at the same time? And yes, uh, you can do that. Yes, for example, yeah. if you multiply the matrix with a block of right hand side vectors and to get a block of left hand side vectors doing multiple SPMVs at the same time then you can set up a model along, uh, along the lines of what I did. And uh, you will see that in the end, the matrix doesn't even matter anymore. Okay? All you do is read the right-hand side vectors, you do stuff and you write the left-hand side vectors. And depending on how many, how, how big the block of vectors is, you may have a very low code balance and you can even decouple from main memory bandwidth if you do that. Yes, that's a and typical optimization. And do you have a sense about how bad can it get? You showed, uh, well, two, I, from my perspective, fairly good cases, 95% and 90% of what might be achieved. How bad can it get? It can get really bad. <laughs> so um, I think in our example later in the hands-on, we have a matrix that is of the order of a factor of three to, to five away from the limit. Okay. Uh, because it not only does it have, well, I don't want to spoil the fun. It has multiple problems, okay? And of course, if you, okay, the good. more the, the matrix is scattered in, in imbalance, there are two problems you could have. 
One is it's really scattered. So the non-zeros are very widely scattered and you get this alpha bigger than one problem. And the other problem is it could be heavily imbalanced. And the imbalance might have a structure even so that even doing some kind of round robin scheduling for open MP or guided scheduling doesn't really help because you're getting into a resonance with these structures. And um, yeah, some matrices have that. So it's easy to have a factor of five to 10 loss yeah, for some matrices. Very, very good, thank you. All right. So this is the SPMB theory for CRS. And now Christy will take over uh, with the first hands-on. Hi. So yeah, let's go on to the hands-on. So for following the hands-on, I would recommend to go on to the slide set. So in the Moodle, so the link is already posted in the chat and click on the hands-on liquid. So this PDF. All right, so in this part one hands-on, we would uh, see how to use liquid topology, how to use liquid pin, and finally, I will come back to the SPMV with CRS code on A64FX. And we will see whether uh, the performance patterns like bandwidth saturation and stuff like that, which Georg just explained, does it make sense on A64FX? Okay, so let's start. So first of all, uh, allocate an exclusive yeah, node on Ukami. So for that, you can use SRAM. And I specify exclusive and yeah, this is redundant CPU per task 48. And I get, I got a node, okay? And then what you can do is you should clone the repository, right? So let me take my slides too. Yeah, so do a git clone of our repository. So this is the, this is a code which does this SPMP. Okay, so we get cloned and I change my directory to this A64 FX SPMV and so on. Right. Um, so yeah, let's right now for a moment think this is a black box code. Okay, I just want to run it. And for running this, the requirement is I need a later latest version of GCC. So, so anything above 10 should work. Uh, so I loaded the current version, which is available on the latest version available on Ukami, which is GCC 11.1. And for, uh, for later analysis using liquid and to use liquid pin or topology, I would need the liquid module. So there is a liquid module already on uh, Ukami, but uh, please don't use this module currently because uh, for some uh, tools like liquid perf counter, this value, the values from this liquid 5.1.1 is not good enough. So uh, instead of that, source uh, uh, liquid module, which we have installed locally in our project. So you can do a source and you can put this path. Okay, so all of these are in the presentation. So all of these parts and stuff are already in the presentation. Okay, so Sorry, one may I just make one yeah. remark here. So if somebody wants to try that, you probably won't have permission to um, to get that from the Hager Group project folder. So uh, did you try right now? Mm -hmm. Yes, I just tried. Oh, okay. It's because we are not group members, so we can't access that folder. Okay. Um, but, I'll try uh, to fix it. I'll try to fix it. Let me. Thanks. Okay, but for now you don't need to uh, source it uh, for the time being. So meanwhile, Kyo will fix it. And so uh, basically to build it, what you need to do is just type make. So there's a make file and it just makes all the, yeah, executables. So it's compiling, let's see. Yeah, basically the code, what it does is basically the sparse matrix vector multiplication. So it takes a matrix and multiplies it with the vector and stores the result. So there's a, it's a benchmark code, okay? So once I type make, you see from, uh, I have 
two executables, so CRS, uh, SPNV CRS GCC, and SPNV cell C GCC. Okay, so let's just run S, uh, SPNV CRS GCC uh, or cell C GCC. Okay, so this is just a black box code for time being. So I am going to run it. So let me, okay, I can use all open MP stuff. Like I tell, okay, if uh, there is some scheduling which is uh, put as runtime, I define it as static and I set the number of threads equal to 48 because this is, uh, so one node of A64 FX is, has 48 cores. So let's put 48 threads and run it. So basically what it, what this benchmark does is it makes a matrix, which is the matrix is HPCG. Uh, so it's constructed from this HPCG. Uh, so it's the same matrix which you encounter in HPCG benchmark. So it's basically this box stencil uh, matrix with 27 neighbors. So since there are 27 neighbors, the number of non-zeros or average number of non-zeros per row the NNZR value is also close to 27. So this is also what is reported here. So the average non-zero value, number of rows, uh, no, number of non-zeros per row, which is close to 27, right? And uh, what you see here is a performance. At the end, you see right now some performance reported. So for this matrix, it takes the matrix and it multiplies it with a vector and puts the result back. And it does it for 162 iterations, the same thing. And you see, okay, it achieves something around 36 gigaflops per second. Okay, right. And let me run it once more to make sure everything's fine. Uh, yeah, again, I get 38, it's just fine. Okay, but now again, the performance increases and so on. So if you keep on repeating, you see, you would see that the performance keeps on fluctuating. Yeah, you see right now I get even 97 gigaflops per second. So which is the correct value? So the problem here is of course, as Thomas mentioned, we didn't pin the uh, threads to the course and we have to do this. And for this, we need liquid. So is the liquid stuff fixed here? I mean, you can I use it directly. With... about what has to be done. I can't fix it as myself. Okay. So the Haga group subdirectory is uh, doesn't have permission for others, and it needs permissions for others. So it needs to be seven seven five or something. Okay. So if there's any admin around, um, not at the moment. But could you use the last project's global folder and just copy that in there because everybody can access that one. Yeah, but that won't work probably because mm, it. Mm, Thomas, would it work? I think it won't work, right? Simple copy. Uh, we can copy it and, and, and try it out before announcing it that it works. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me try to copy it. Uh, where should I copy it? Luster. Luster Projects Global. Yeah, but shouldn't you copy? No, you need. You still need the all all the installation stuff in the in our directory. Probably you should copy everything, right? Oh, that's true. I Is Dave be. Carlson on Slack over? Yeah. No, I will have a look. Ah, permission denied. I can't. There may even be a script that's running in the background to enforce the high level project permissions. That, so. Oh, that's, that's not good. Okay, let's do one thing. Let's do one thing. Let me check one thing. Uh, for the time being, till we fix this, you can also try module load. For this experiment, you could try module load liquid. Okay, so this should also work for this experiment. Yeah. So for time being, you could do module load liquid. So you can do the current installation of liquids. Just do a module load liquid for time being. Okay. Uh, so 
if you have loaded the liquid module, you would you can do liquid topology, for example, and see the topology first. So on A64 FX, we see yeah, it's Fujitsu A64 FX, and it has yeah four sockets. This is what Thomas explained. It's actually four dies and one socket, but it's, it reports as four sockets. And we see there are 12 cores per CMG or per die. And yeah, there, are, there is no SMT. That's why it reports as threads per core is one. And here we see the hardware threads, so zero to 47. So there are 48 cores to say. Yeah, and it tells which die, the socket uh, column tells which die they belong to. So from zero to, so zero to 11 is on one CMG and 12 to 23 is on the next CMG and so on. Okay. And yeah, finally you see also as Thomas explained, there are four number domains and how they are located. So you see the topology. And now we can pin. So for pinning, uh, first of all, you can read the help if you need liquid pin and specify dash H, then you get the help output and uh, what might be interesting is liquid pin dash P, the option dash P would tell you what are the thread groups, for example. So what are the available thread groups on this architecture? So this is, there is domain N, for example, this is the complete node. And then there is this die zero or socket zero, socket one up to socket three. And also the same is the thing with memory domains, M zero to M three. Okay, so now let's, uh, run it on the full node. So let's take domain N and up to zero to 47. So let's do this. So I can do OMP schedule equal to, equal to static OMP num threads equal to 48. And basically what I just add is liquid pin and I specify dash C, so the cores are from zero to 47. So by default, it is N zero to 47, but I don't need even to specify N in this case, because by default it is domain is the full node. And I run SPMV cell GCC. So here, what you see here is you see, okay, my first main thread is pinned to core zero. The first thread that is started gets pinned to core one and the next to core two and so on. And we see it's pinned to core 47. And here you observe that the performance is really high compared to the other values which we had. So previously we had some values like 38 and 43 and at sometimes it reached also 97, but right now we reach 114 gigaflops per second. And if I repeat it, you will, if you repeat it, you will observe that this performance stays almost in the same ballpark, okay? So you see it always remains close to this 114 gigaflops per second, All right? Okay, so that's about liquid pin. Now let's uh, go to CRS code, which Georg explained. So SPMV with CRS code. Before I go there, are there any questions? Because in chat, I see some. Okay. Okay, there are problems with conflicts. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's uh, see the CRS code. So it's in SRC kernels.cpp. And basically, this is uh, SPMV done using the CRS data storage format for uh, yeah, sparse matrices. And what you see here is uh, there's a loop along all the rows of the matrix. That is the outermost loop. And the innermost loop goes over the non zeros within each row of the matrix, okay, of the sparse matrix. Right. And in, inside the loop, I multiply the matrix entry with the uh, input uh, right hand side vector X. Okay. So X is the input right hand side vector. And I accumulate the result and finally I store it to the B. Uh, so the B vector, yeah, that's this output. And uh, on the outer loop, I parallelize, uh, I do a shared memory parallelization using OpenMP and I specify schedule as runtime. So it takes whatever 
uh, environmental variable I set for OMP schedule. Okay. Um, so to run this code, it's basically instead of cell C, you have to just type CRS GCC, right? And let's run it on the full node. Okay. Okay. You observe a performance of 60 gigaflops per second. Is it good? Is it bad? We don't have any idea because uh, we have to first construct the roof line model for A64FX, so the performance model as chaos shown, and come up um, and have an estimate whether this is good or bad. But before doing that, let's stick with one socket and run some benchmarks or run some scaling tests. So we start with a single core that is only using one core, that is I pin I use only one thread and I pin it to core zero and I run the benchmark and then I go to two threads, three threads and I pin this always on uh, the, so in a closed manner. So now if I need two threads, I, uh, yeah, if I need two threads, I use OMP num threads two and I pin it to the zeroth core and the first core and so on. So I do it, let's, scan this for the one socket. So from zero to 11 course. To do this, there is a script which does basically, yeah, the same work. So you can just run the script and it will report the number of threads used, the performance and the speed up. Right. So with one thread, I receive a performance of 1.28 gigaflops per second, uh, which is basically speed up of one and with two, threads, I get 2x speed up, three threads, I get 3x speed up, and so on, okay? So basically, uh, when seeing the performance plot of SPMV on uh, Cascade Lake, which Georg showed in the previous presentation, we saw that the speed up at some point should decrease, right? Because it, it saturates the main memory bandwidth. Uh, let's see when this happens on this machine. Okay, so basically you see even at 10 threads of the out of 12 in one CMG, it doesn't basically saturate because it attains almost 10 X speed up. And with 12 threads, it attains again, almost 12 X speed up. So if you plot this, you should see something, uh, should see something like this. You should see a pretty good linear scaling. So the speed up should be pretty, yeah, with 12 threads, you get 12 X speed up. In speed up wise, this is good, but I don't see any saturation for this code on A64FX. So there is no saturation. And yeah, even if you run it till 48 threads, that is the complete node of, A6, uh, of A64FX on Ukami, you wouldn't see any uh, saturation because basically if you see any saturation, you should see within one NUMA domain that is with 12, uh, with 12 threads, for example. But you don't see any saturation here. And yeah, basically with one NUMA domain that is with 12 uh, threads, I, re I reach something like 15 gigaflops per second. And with four CMG, that is the full node, I attain 60. That is 15 times six, uh, 15 times four, 60 gigaflops per second, right? So what's happening? We don't uh, right now have any idea. So what we do is we need to have a deeper look. And to uh, do can, that, I, can I chime in here for a moment? So here, the, the scalability of the code is an indication that something's wrong, okay? You need to let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> it's not that it's good because it's scalable, it's bad because it's scalable. And we're gonna find out why. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and the uh, plot that is uh, plotted here, it's uh, the performance versus the number of threads, okay? Can, can I inquire, uh, how are the threads bound? Are they bound and ran, rolled into the CMGs or are you populating CMG1 and then CMG2? So, so it's uh, right now, it's similar to what you do like OMP proc bind is equal to close and OMP places equal to course. So it's in a closed manner. So 
if you see the alien script, let's see. Uh, basically, what it does is, uh, if I have like say ten threads, I will set on pin num threads equal to ten, and I pin from zero to nine. So goes from zero to nine. So it's in a closed manner, right? Okay. So no, one twenty eight cube is about sixteen megabytes. Is that right? Uh, yes, but one twenty eight okay. um, whole cube uh, times twelve twelve bytes for okay. the matrix, which yeah, which is almost twenty five, right? Okay. Uh, so and times twenty seven because you have to store the non zeros. So one twenty eight cube is just the number of rows, uh, okay. and you have twenty seven non zeros per, which means I have almost six hundred and seventy nine megabytes. Per iteration. So this won't fit in any cache. So yeah, that's a good right. question. <laughs> if it fits in a cache, you you could have observed something like this, right? If you uh, because then it's not obviously it's not memory bound, for example. But this uh, code doesn't fit in cache. So it's it has more than six hundred megabytes, and the last level cache on this system you can also observe. Uh, you can also see this from liquid topology. Hmm. All right. So you're, you're, you're in the unhappy state of not being memory bound. Cool, cool, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, so to dive deeper, we need to analyze the assembly code and we have to find it out what's happening. And we use the tool Osaka to analyze this. But before that, if you need to generate the assembly code, what you can do is you can basically type make ASM and this will generate the assembly code for you for the kernel. So after this, we will go to the Osaka tool uh, yeah, lecture. Are there any questions regarding this? Uh, let's see. So, so now the assembly is done and the it's in the DCC kernel.s should give you the assembly code, right? And now I'll hand over to Jan to go to, uh, yeah, to explain what's happening. So if there are no more questions. Okay, then Jan. Thank you, Christy. Um, let me share my screen for this. Uh, so unfortunately, we like have to keep this uh, as kind of a cliffhanger for now because for understanding uh, what's going on, we have to take a few steps back and first learn like what is Osaka actually doing and, and how can we understand all of this. Uh, so there is again some theory and then we, we go back um, to exactly this assembly code Christy showed us. Um, as Georg already mentioned, uh, Osaka stands for Open Source Architecture Code Analyzer. Um, so what does this mean and, and what are we doing with this? Um, you might remember also this uh, formula of the roofline model being the minimum of our Pmax and our bandwidth uh, and the code balance. And this linear scaling. And as Georg said, like, this is actually not what we want to see, right? We want to see some saturation. Uh, so obviously, this code is not at, as memory bound as we thought it is. Uh, so the, the previous assumption we had of Pmax being insignificant might be wrong. Uh, we have to find out this. Uh, so we somehow need to actually define or like find out what Pmax is. And for this, uh, the income modeling is required, and this is where Osaka comes into play. Um, some assumptions for this, we also had some of that already. Um, we're always looking at the steady state execution, so we don't take into account the warm up phase or the cool down phase, uh, since we're um, mostly assuming streaming kernels. Um, all that data comes from L1 cache, which like is the definition uh, of the inco part for us. Uh, if we want to look like beyond L1, there would be other tools also provided by our team. Uh, one would be Cancraft, uh, which is not be covered here, just simply due to time constraints. Um, and of course, for 
each architecture we are we're looking at, since it's the in code modeling, uh, we need some architecture specific hardware model, which we also call port model. Why do we call it port model? Um, because you can think of the in core architecture uh, having several functional units, um, like uh, a loop part, something doing the uh, fused multiply at um, operations, uh, maybe some specific ports for loading data, for storing data. Uh, this really depends on the architecture change, changes within every new um, like generation of architecture, like Sandy Bridge is obviously different than Cascade Lake um, and so on. So we somehow first have to set up this hardware model, which is already included into Osaka. And then uh, we can analyze the code we want to look at um, and like assign, that's what the scheduler would do, uh, assign the different operations uh, to the specific ports of the functional units. And then out of this, uh, we can draw a conclusion of how long uh, this specific kernel might need uh, to run inside of the core. Okay, there are um, basically three terms um, I need you to, to know and to understand for all of this modeling. This is uh, the throughput, the latency, and loop carry dependencies. Oops, sorry. Uh, so the throughput, um, normally like functions as the lowercase prediction. If there are no dependencies, if we can execute everything uh, completely independently, the latency of course is uh, the latency, the, the time our kernel needs from the start to the end uh, to execute at least once. And the loop carry dependency defines uh, the time which is needed to execute one iteration of our code if there are some intra-loop dependencies, which means our actual, our current iteration depends on the previous iteration and there are some data depend, uh, dependencies, for example. And our simplified like estimation for this in core time then TC is uh, the maximum of our throughput and our loop carry dependency time. You can keep that in mind for later. Okay, but what does this actually mean? For this, we look at some really simple examples to, to understand those three terms. Uh, and for that, I constructed a um, like hypothetical architecture port model. So let's assume we have six different functional units and therefore instructions. Those are just bubbles here. It can be like plus minus divided by whatever you can imagine, uh, but six different types of instructions. All of them um, need one cycle to execute, both in uh, like taken for themselves, but also uh, when run in parallel, since they all have their own functional units. Uh, we can say the reciprocal throughput is one cycle, so one iteration per cycle is the, the throughput, and yeah, the, the latency is one cycle as mentioned. Uh, now let's look at a program on, on that architecture. Uh, this is our, our code, let's say. We have uh, blue, green, turkeys, and orange, so they're just four different instructions. We can say there are no dependencies within the, this loop, and also no intra-loop dependencies, which would be modeled here in this code with errors, you will see later. Uh, so just based on this information of our port model uh, and this code, you now could already predict uh, the throughput of this code is one cycle and our critical path, so the latency of the full code of the kernel uh, would be also one cycle. And there's no dependency, so uh, this means we also don't have a loop carry dependency. Uh, if you would now run it, um, and here we have the time on our axis. In the first cycle, we could just schedule all four instructions at the same time, since again there are no uh, no dependencies. In the next cycle, again all four, all four, and so on and so on. So we would actually see the runtime would be one cycle per instruction, and our throughput prediction uh, would be uh, verified here and then would be true. So let's 
make it a little bit more complicated. Let's add some dependencies. So you can see our, our green bubble can only be executed after the blue one, the turquoise one also just after the blue one. And finally, the orange instruction can only start after having the result of the blue and the turquoise one. Uh, so here we have some dependencies, but still no intra loop dependencies, no loop curve dependencies. Uh, so again, we could predict already um, if we are in the steady state after the warm up time, um, we will finish one iteration after each cycle. And we also can see the longest critical path here is from blue to turquoise to orange. So that would be three cycles. Looking at this now again on our timeline, uh, a program execution would look like this. And then we could start our second iteration right in cycle two or in, in time slot two, since we only uh, can do one functional unit at the same time. So the blue functional port is, or blue port is still occupied here, here at three again, again. So we can start our second iteration. Uh, but the other ones always depend on some previous iterations inside of this loop. So they can only start in the second or in the th third iteration. Uh, the same for our second iteration and then our third. So we see being in steady state, our first iteration ends here and then it's one cycle, it's one cycle, it would be one cycle and so on and so on. So the runtime prediction here would be again, one cycle per iteration. Our throughput prediction is fulfilled, uh, all good. So far, um, this is, uh, this is easy and the critical path we can see here is the three cycles I already mentioned. Um, and also this doesn't matter here for our uh, overall uh, runtime execution after the warm up phase, uh, because they can fully overlap since there are no dependencies. Okay, one last bubble example to make it a little bit more complex. Um, now we're having an intra loop dependency back from orange to our first blue bubble uh, in the next iteration and some other code going on here and actually another intra loop dependency from the red bubble of iteration X to iteration X plus one. Like you could imagine this is a, a pointer increment, for example. Um, so this is, now, as, yeah, as you can imagine, a bit more complicated. So let's see how it would execute, right? So uh, the first three bubbles would still be the same. We have to start with blue, then can do turquoise, then can do orange, after that purple, and then red. But when would our next iteration start now? Can we do it again in the next cycle, or do we have to wait a bit longer? We have to wait until our orange instruction is executed, right, since of this dependency. So our second iteration would only start here. We also have to wait for the red one to finish, but this is long done. So after another three cycles, our third iteration would start and so on. Uh, so here, after like getting out of our warm-up phase and, and the steady state execution, we would see a runtime of three cycles per iteration since our loop pair dependency gets from orange to blue and let us wait, even though the functional unit would be free after this, after the first cycle actually uh, to start again, we can't because we have to wait uh, for the orange input here. So now we can see the throughput predict prediction, which would still be one because we use each functional unit only once in our kernel and in theory could do it like in the first example, uh, running all in parallel. This is not possible due to dependencies uh, so here we would get the maximum out of the throughput and the loop code dependency prediction, which is the maximum of one and three. So three cycles per iteration. And this is basically what happens inside of Osaka, just a little bit more complicated since our port model is not as easy as this one. Um, but this is exactly how we model uh, the inquiry execution. Here you can see the critical path, which would be now even longer than the three cycle, uh, since that's the longest path and the 
the maximum time we need to execute our kernel once, but our loop query dependency is only created out of those three bubbles and then in the next iteration and again and again. Uh, yeah, as I said, the part model of A64FX would look something like this. Uh, you don't have to understand all of this, of course, uh, just to give you uh, like a few uh, information about that. We normally sp split this into a front end and the back end. Uh, after decoding, you have those five different reservation stations um, and those schedule uh, the instructions coming in from the decoder then to the different ports. We have some uh, floating point ports, FLA and FLB, integer ports, EXA, EXB, and the data ports for uh, loading and address generation. Uh, and the store part is executed, of course, also on the, on the HU ports, as well as depending on if it's a float or if it's an integer, FLA or EXA. And as you can see here, the reservation stations uh, are separated. There's not one like global reservation station, but uh, different ones, which only have up to 20 entries or even less for our uh, addresses here. Uh, so this might also already give you um, like an idea of why sometimes it can be difficult to achieve the performance uh, we expect uh, due to just this physical limitation of uh, of 20 entries, the out of order execution can look ahead because as soon as an instruction comes into either RSE zero or one, uh, this can't be changed anymore, right? So uh, it might be you get some imbalance between the ports due to the limited size of our reservation stations. Um, yeah, and for Osaka, we assume perfect out of order execution and scheduling. So we would only look at this part and do our schedule, uh, our, our uh, predictions based on this port model. Uh, now let's have a look at a real uh, example um, to, to fully understand. Also, please interrupt me whenever you have questions. I don't know if there are any so far. I can't see the chat. Maybe I will have a quick look. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, just interrupt me. Um, because I know it can be it can be a bit messy. Um, so as a simple example, we're looking at the stream triad, which only consists, uh, I think many of you know that, uh, out of a uh, add and a multiply, which is normally done fused with a FMA instruction. We load two different values and write back to another one. So if we would uh, convert this or translate it into assembly, and this was actually done on a A64 of X machine. So this is uh, the original code. Um, you can see two loads, which would be our B and C here, vector loads, of course, uh, then the fused multiply and that, and finally the store. And then we have the pointer increment and the check if the loop is already done or if we would jump again to our first later and do this. So how would this internally work? Uh, what is the pipeline length of A64FX? I actually don't know that. I can't tell you. Uh, since we assume, again, like a perfect out of order execution, this uh, we always assume the, the pipeline is completely filled at this point. So it doesn't matter since we uh, retire a structure every, every cycle. Uh, but I can look this up and give you an answer later. Um, so if we would now uh, analyze this and, and uh, predict the runtime for that, we would look at our first load. We know because it's written in our database, um, the load can go to either EHEA or EHEB. Here it would be on, on the B part, but it could be on any of those. Uh, the other load as well, since we want to um, like make it in a in a best efficient way, this would be probably scheduled to the other part of those two. Then we have our fused multiply in that, which can be also run on two different ports. Uh, the store instruction, uh, which actually occupies three ports for one full cycle. 
and our ad that can be on four different ports and um, like our, our while and the, the jump back to our label. So this would be one uh, like sequential execution. Um, but as we know, uh, we will do it in um, like after the warm-up phase. Uh, so all of this could run uh, in parallel since there are no uh, intra-loop dependencies. So our second execution of uh, our second iteration, the execution of our second iteration can start directly uh, as soon as the load ports are free again, our third one again. So here we could see we need two cycles for one vector length, which is also important that this doesn't mean it's a high level iteration, right? Because we're working on eight elements uh, in parallel if our uh, vector length is 512 bit. But the runtime for this would be two cycles per vector length. And a classic Osaka output for this uh, would look very similar to the examples we did. And that's why I wanted you to uh, like bear with me to, to understand this picture. Uh, here you can see the simplified port model of the A64FX. We have the same ports uh, as in the picture. On the right side, you can see the instructions we have in our kernel and everything from zero to seven in this case is our throughput prediction uh, for, the, for the different ports. So exactly what we did with pen and paper and the slides before. Then you can see the critical path and you can see the loop current dependency. And now we would check like what's uh, the maximum, what's uh, the expected runtime of this kernel, uh, the maximum out of throughput and loop current dependency. The LCD is zero here. So we only have to check the throughput. And here we can see we would be bound by our load port. So this is the EHEA and EHEB. Uh, here we divide it into actually address generation and uh, data. Uh, and we can see two cycles would be the expected runtime. And if you would run your kernel, which we have here, uh, you could actually measure that and verify, verify this number. Okay, now we can finally, after working us through the basics to our SPMV code. And this, uh, I want to show you as a hands-on as well. Uh, you can work on this with me together. Uh, this would mean you need to install Osaka first. I expect uh, none of them has it. And I also don't know how the Python environment on Okami would look like. Um, I can put I something in the chat how everybody can access. So we have it installed. I will put it in the chat in a second. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. Otherwise, if you're working on a local machine, like for example, I'm here on, uh, on my local laptop just because uh, I don't need to occupy any node for this since I already compiled all the data and, and the files. If you would do it locally, you would simply do a, uh, sorry, a pip install or you clone the repository uh, and install it locally, whatever you prefer and how your Python environment looks like. And yeah, if I just posted the uh, modulode instruction for Okami. I don't know if there is a CanCraft included as well, Eva, if you installed all dependencies or not. Um, so you might can't do all of the hands-on, uh, but you will see that later. Uh, so Christy already, uh, already did the make ASM to create the assembly files. So now we actually start at the point where we left before. Um, I won't do that here, as you know, since this is uh, not the Okami cluster, but I go in the GCC directory and here I can see my assembly files. And we know our, uh, our kernel is in the kernel assembly. Uh, if our um, like assembly reading ability is good enough, we can just find it inside of the assembly uh, and then either extract it from there to analyze it, or we can add markers, what we are going to do. Uh, but there's also a really handy tool with Osaka, which gives you an approximation which kernel we're looking for. Um, and this is called 
insert marker. So let's try if we can find out where our kernel is by letting Osaka or Cancraft, which is used by Osaka here, um, to find out where, where it is. And again, uh, normally you need to have installed Cancraft uh, as well. So I don't know if this is possible now for you since uh, it's not by default installed when you install Osaka. Uh, you would need to have to do another pip install cancraft, um, or there's another module, uh, maybe ether can help. Um, but if you have it installed, we could say insert marker. And since uh, the marker depend on the architecture, the micro architecture we're using, since x86 and ARM is different, uh, we have to add our micro architecture. Uh, since it's a Kami, we use a 64 fx uh, There are some different architectures here, as you can see, but that's what we're interested in. Uh, and we add the file we want to check, kernel says. And now it provides us possible blocks to be marked. Uh, this is based on uh, the number of SIMD instructions um, and, and uh, arithmetic instructions done in here. So that's why we have uh, multiple options. And it actually says uh, it would suggest label six. Uh, so now we could have a look here where our label six is. It's the very first one. And we can see this is actually our uh, SPMV kernel. We load um, the, the column index of our right-hand side. We load uh, the non-zeros. Then based on our, our C0, we do a gather here to get our right-hand side. And then we have the pointer increment here, like just, I don't know why it's not in the end. Uh, that's uh, part of the, the compiler's work. Uh, and then we do our fused multiply add based on, on the vectors we just loaded and write it back to the left-hand side. So update our left-hand side. And again, check if, we, if we're if we done or if we have to start again and go back to label six. So so this is exactly what we were looking for. That's nice. Uh, so we will just tell Osaka, okay, let's take L6. And if we would now check our assembly file again and search for Osaka, we can see the markers were added automatically in here. Uh, these are the byte markers because uh, on x86, there is also a tool for Intel called Yaka, which only works with compiled assembly and therefore needs byte markers. Uh, that's why we support this option. If you just do a manual analysis and you don't need any uh, other program software, uh, need to find out those markers, um, you could also do it manually, just simply with commands. And this is where now everyone can uh, like work again with me finding this L6 and then at Osaka begin for the start marker and Osaka and for the end marker. But this is exactly the same as keeping the byte markers in. I just changed it now to show you uh, the maybe more handy uh, comment markers, but both is possible. Okay, so we edit our markers. Uh, if we don't do that, the full assembly file will be analyzed, which might create some problems due to some really random uh, addresses in the beginning. Uh, so it might be Osaka breaks. If you just take the full assembly file, also it might take a lot of time if you have uh, like several thousand lines of code. Uh, so I recommend to add some markers here it's just faster and it shows you what you want to see and not just everything because not all of this is a loop. It also doesn't make sense um, to analyze everything. Good, we close our file again and we can do the analysis. Again, for this, we need to add our architecture we wanna analyze and the now marked file. Let's see what we get. The same output as you saw on the slides before. So we have our ports and our throughput prediction uh, on the left side. And then we can see our critical path and our loop carry dependency of exactly the code 
uh, we just marked. And if we first look at our, our throughput prediction, we can see we would be uh, again data bound here because we have the gather inside here for our right hand side. Uh, the gather is more costly than just a uh, consecutive load, which needs two cycles on both ports. Uh, so the throughput prediction here would be three cycles, but let's not forget about our loop carry dependencies. Uh, since we do updates on our left hand side, we can see it uh, detects a loop carry dependency here, uh, which is the latency of our fused multiply add. And that's nine cycles. And those nine cycles are, of course, uh, larger than the three cycles. So uh, this kernel actually needs nine cycles per vector length um, to, to execute. Here in the lower part, you can also see other loop carry dependencies, but the largest one is always shown here. So this is only our um, update of our pointer again. So this is what we're interested. Uh, so based on this, we could actually find out now, uh, well, our, our expectation of this kernel is actually nine cycle per, per vector length. And if we would do the math now and transform this to uh, chief flops, um, or something we measured before, which, which Christy did, uh, we would see uh, that this actually translates uh, to the nine cycles and we are bound by this in part. Um, another handy part I want to show you before going back to the slides is if we have a, a somehow more complicated kernel and therefore maybe dependency graph of not just one instruction, uh, we can use Osaka also to create us the uh, like visual graph of this. For this, we use uh, the export graph function. We would uh, use the same call as before, but now add export graph and the file name. And this creates us both the output we just saw and also uh, a dot file which is uh, by default called Osaka DG for dependency graph. Um, and with this dot file, um, we can create a PDF, for example, or anything else, SVG, whatever you want to do with your dot file, um, and have a look at this one. That's this. And what we can see now is that uh, we actually get exactly our kernel here um, with the line numbers we saw here, so 63 up to 70 with all of our instructions. Uh, and we can see in, in the bold boxes our critical path and with the latencies written on here, uh, the arrows as dependencies and with the colored paths, the loop carry dependencies we have in here. So there are two, the orange one, the add we saw before, and uh, the one bounding the performance with the nine cycles of our loop carry dependencies. So in case you don't have a overview what your kernel actually does, this gives you also a nice overview to maybe get more insight in, in what instructions are connected to which. Okay, any questions uh, regarding the hands-on? I have a question, not so much with regard to the hands-on maybe, but uh, uh, we have some really fat loops. What, what, what are the limitations of the tool in terms of the size loop you can actually digest? Um, so, the problem with a larger sized loop is only the time it needs to analyze. So it, it depends on uh, how long you want to wait. Um, and here, Osaka, we have to say, is quite a bit slow um, because the dependency detection inside here creates a graph for all of the instructions. And then we're looking for a cyclic path inside of there. So the more complex this is, the longer it takes. Uh, there is an option 
you can use for very long, uh, for very long graphs, which says LCD timeout. Um, so this is normally set to 10 seconds. If you uh, analyze a kernel and it takes more than 10 seconds, it will just gives you what it founds up to that point. Uh, you could set it to one second, and then this time is uh, reduced accordingly. Um, otherwise, uh, what takes also quite some time is just the read-in of the database, but this is only uh, the very first run. I don't know if you have noticed when maybe you were, were like working with me on the hands-on, uh, probably your run will have taken much longer than mine because I already had that data file, uh, the database file cached and then um, written as a, a pickle file inside of uh, our Osaka directory. Uh, this is only for the first time then it's cached. Um, but giving you some absolute numbers, I would say uh, you're within a few seconds, um, like let's say two seconds per 100 lines of assembly, but this is really just ballpark. Uh, so it's okay for manual, uh, for manual uh, analysis if you want to automize it and like go through a thousand kernels this might take definitely some time yeah very good thank you very much you're welcome any other questions just a comment okay. uh the provided Osaka module that uh, for which Eva has posted um, the commands does not know the integer load, the first ah, instruction okay. in the kernel. So if you did that with the installed version, then it doesn't know the first instruction of the kernel. Yeah, so you might don't have the 0.45 version. Uh, that's actually true, yeah, I updated that. Um, what you can always do and what's good to know uh, if you, don't can't execute all instructions, but you know uh, you might don't care about any of, of those you can't uh, support. Um, you can use ignore unknown, uh, which gives you an analysis no matter of uh, the unknown instructions and just analyzes all the ones uh, it understands. You could also always add manually your instructions. This is all written in the documentation. Um, since the database is also here in the in the directories, you can create your own database. Uh, but all of this, of course, needs some manual effort. If you don't have them in there and you just want a quick and dirty analysis, you might want to go with the ignore unknown uh, command here. Yeah. Sorry for not uh, updating the Okami version to to the most current one. Um, let me go back to the slides, this one. So what we did right now is exactly this, just not manually, since we don't have to do it manually, luckily. Um, and here you can see three cycles per vector length because we don't care about any dependencies, but we know there's this loop code dependency in here, which we can see in the output then. Um, Another nice thing, if you like, for example, as right now, and that's a good thing to uh, check, don't have the most current version. Let's see how I can get back to, yeah. Uh, there's a tool called Compiler Explorer by Matt Gottbold. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. It's a really nice tool in, in my opinion, uh, which normally is used to, let's see if it opens. Where is it? Here we are. Sorry, it's on the wrong screen. Uh, which is normally used for checking uh, the output, what a compiler gives you for the high level code. And if you click on the link um, I posted on the slides and also in the Moodle, um, I provided the actually the actual C code running here uh, and the struct we need just to get the, the output. Uh, and it shows you what the compiler would do with it. Given some flags I added up here uh, and we can see and we can find our uh, sparse matrix vector uh, multiplication here as well. The same uh, load of our column, the uh, 
together the other load and the fuse multiply that. And then we could do the Osaka analysis also in here uh, since it's integrated in the compiler explorer. We would click on add tool. I already did that in the link I, I put there, but you would have this tool for each compiler. You would click on add tool and here you have the most current version. Um, then it gives you analysis of the whole kernel. That's not what we want. So we would add here on the one hand, we can add the uh, architecture just to get rid of the warning. Uh, we would add something like minus minus lines to just get a range. So we would check the assembly from 25 up to 31. That's what we need. So I would add a minus minus lines 25 to 31. And we can see the same output we just created locally, uh, really handy in the web-based Godball. So whenever you just need something uh, fast and you don't want to install everything new or something and you are on a system, you can't actually install something, uh, you might want to check out the compiler explorer, um, paste the code and analyze it this way. I also, added this other link, which is based on the direct assembly snippet. The only difference between those two examples is that our C code has the C++ editor and is based on the C code, while this one is chosen as analysis and we can paste our assembly code directly and get the same as, as before. And this uh, is updated by once whenever we get a new version. So here you can really expect the most current version. Uh, yeah, since since we are doing the pull request for the compiler explorer ourselves. Uh, well, yeah, that's all. There are some more slides about the marker creation we covered already. Just for you as a reminder, some overview about the other different tools that don't want to go into detail here. Also, the way how you can get it. Uh, I might add the module load for Okami here, uh, since I actually didn't know it exists. But, so I will add this point as well. Um, and yeah, with that, we can we can go to the next point, which I think is actually a break, right, Georg? Yes, yes. So we should really we have a break it. now. <laughs> yeah. We've got to walk around. Right. Yeah, right. So uh, would 10 minutes be OK? Let's make it 15. What do you think? I, I think five or 10, I, I, I wouldn't go more, but. Okay, let's say 10. Okay, so give people a little okay. bit of opportunity to stretch their legs and maybe have a coffee and have a bio break. Okay, so let's continue in 10 minutes. That would be like uh, 10 12, minutes 10. past noon for you. Yeah. All right. Hope you're refreshed. Welcome back. Um, I'm Thank sorry, we're a wee bit behind schedule. So I try to speed up. Um, I continue with a little bit of um, um, sparse matrix vector theory. And we saw that with a CRS format on A64FX, the main problem is uh, if we look into the assembly code that this big latency of nine cycles for this fused multiply add. The main, main problem is that we have a loop carrot dependency. The code accumulates into the same register in every iteration. So each iteration can only start after the last iteration has completed specifically the fused multiply add instruction. So each iteration costs nine cycles. Um, that's one part of the problem. The other part, which we haven't actually shown in Osaka, is that after the loop, so after one row has been processed, um, you do not have the final result for this row. You have eight partial sums that have to be collected or added up to get the final row sum. And this has, uh, has to be done using a horizontal add across the register. And this horizontal add is a very inefficient instruction. It takes um, a latency of, I think, 49 cycles. And even if you have many of those, the throughput is, the inverse throughput is only 11.5 cycles. So you can only start each of these instructions every 11.5 cycles, which means there's a lot of time um, taken by this dependency chain, this loop carry dependency, plus the overall, the, the, the final reduction across the register. And depending on how many non-zeros per row you have, the loop length is of course, number of non-zeros per row divided by eight due to the Cindy factor. Adding all these things up, 
you can calculate depending on the matrix that you may not be able to saturate. And this is the case for the HPCG matrix that Christy has shown. Okay, so how can we solve this problem? We have three problems. The inner loop is short for many matrices and the SIMD parallelization makes it even shorter because you do things in packets of eight. So the overall the loop length as seen by the pipelines of the processor is divided by eight. You have even shorter loops, which makes the loop startup uh, even more um, prominent. <clears throat> you have a loop carry dependency due to the sum reduction and you have an exp expensive horizontal add at the end. Now we can think of several remedies. Um, and one remedy is to use a matrix storage format that's friendly to wide SIMD architectures and that allows us to solve at least or mitigate some of the problems we identified. And the format that we choose is Celsius Sigma. It was developed here at Erlangen. If you wanna know the details, there's a paper from a couple of years ago where you can find all the theory behind it. The idea is um, in order to make it more simply friendly that we look at the matrix, the sparse matrix and we sort the rows according to their row length. So the number of non-zeros in every row uh, we choose a so-called sorting scope sigma. So you choose blocks of sigma rows and which each, within each block, you sort the rows according to their length. Okay, this is shown over here, all the bright blue boxes. These are the original rows. Now you sort the rows and then you store the non-zeros which have originally been stored in a um, row major order. You store them in a column major order but not across the whole sorting range but across blocks of height C. So why do we do that? In the end, we have um, blocks of height C. Several of those blocks make up a sorting range. And then in the new sorting range, we start again with sorting um, the rows according to the number of non-zeros. Within each block of height C, we pad the matrix entries with zeros so that this block becomes a rectangle, okay? So there's no, um, no if conditions here. Everything that's missing from making a rectangle is just um, added in terms of zeros which means we have blocks of a certain width and of height C, and within each block, the storage scheme is color major. Now this means if we go through the matrix and multiply um, the matrix entry with the right-hand side accumulate to the left-hand side, we can code down these columns in these blocks. Yeah, and these columns then should then have something to do with the SIMD width of the machine. For example, if you have a SIMD width of eight, then the chunk height C should be eight or a small multiple of that. Or if you're on a GPU and you have a warp size of 32, then C should be 32 or 64 or a small multiple of that. Of course, there's some zero padding involved and depending on the original structure of the matrix, you may have significant uh, padding overhead. You can quantify this overhead by a number we call beta, the chunk occupancy. And this is just, um, beta is smaller or equal to one. If beta is one, there's no fill in, no zero fill whatsoever. If beta is smaller than one, it means that uh, chunks are not fully occupied, meaning there is significant uh, zero fill in. And this is just the number of non zeros of the matrix originally divided by the number of entries after the Celsius sigma conversion. Okay, so beta is something between zero and one. You want it to be close to one, to have as uh, little as possible fill in. Okay, so now if we assume this kind of storage structure, we can look at uh, the code for the sparse matrix vector multiplication. And here we have an example for C equals four. So that would be fitting, for example, for a machine that has a SIMD width, a SIMD register width of 32 bytes, like an AVX2 machine. Um, the outer loop is still um, over the rows, but not quite, it's actually over the blocks. So the outer loop goes from zero to N uh, divided by four, it numbers the blocks. Each block is of, si of um, height C equals four in this case. So the number of iterations of the outer loop is N over four. The inner loop <clears throat> goes over the columns of one block and within each column, we go down the column. So here you see immediately, this is an, an um, inner loop unrolling. You see immediately that this is a SIMD friendly formulation because you can map the left-hand side entries which are accumulated into to a SIMD register. Of course, you're still stuck with the indirect access to the right-hand side. You, we're not gonna get rid of that, okay? But the access to the value is still uh, cache friendly, okay? Now, what does that get us? 
What does that mean? And I'll come to that in a minute, but first I'd like to uh, cover the question, how do we choose the parameters? I chose C equals four here for educational reasons because the, um, the code fits on a slide easily, but in practice, you ask yourself, what should I choose for C and Sigma? Now for C, of course, as I already mentioned, you want C to be a multiple of the SIMD width. And the easiest choice is to say C equals SIMD width, like um, eight for SVE or 32 for a GPU, for NVIDIA GPU. To allow for good utilization of SIMD units to not have any remainder loops or any scalar uh, loops. Now, there are situations where you want N to be bigger than one, and you can do that in order to be able to hide the add pipeline latency. Because if you look at this, if this loop kernel is vectorized and all this is done in a single multiply add instruction with this as a target register, it means we're still stuck with this loop carrot dependency. We're just doing more work in the iteration, but that doesn't change the basic fact that we're still having this loop carrot dependency, okay? If you choose C um, bigger than your SIMD width, you could accumulate into multiple separate registers concurrently so that these dependencies can overlap each other within the pipeline. And this is a very useful feature for A64FX, as you will see. So N equals one is useful for hiding the add pipeline latency, which is long, which is high in, in, with nine cycles on this processor. Now as for Sigma, Sigma should be as small as possible, but as large as necessary. Why should it be as small as possible? It should be small because if you resort the whole matrix, it also alters the right-hand side access pattern which means your alpha, if you really do heavy reordering of the matrix, alpha depends on sigma and it may get worse. And we, we observed that actually. So um, don't sort more than necessary. Also large sigma uh, reduces the zero padding. That's the positive impact of sigma. If you don't sort it all, so sigma equals one, this is a well-known format, which is called um, um, cell or um, sliced LPAC. Uh, but if you don't sort it all, then depending on the structure of the matrix, you may end up with a lot of uh, fill-in. Whereas if you do sort, you can collect long rows in blocks and then short rows into other blocks so that the fill-in gets reduced. So the higher sigma, the smaller typically the fill-in. But if you make it too high, too large, then alpha uh, becomes large. Okay, so this is the rationale behind um, choosing sigma and C. Now let's look at, um, a kernel that we later will be using in the demo, in the hands-on for demonstrating cell C sigma on A64FX. I hope you can read this. <clears throat> this is cell 32 sigma. Um, and this is the Osaka analysis on the A64FX for cell, cell 32 sigma. C equals 32 means that we're not using C equals eight. C equals eight would be the minimum. This is the SIMD width of the machine. We're using 32 to be able to accumulate into four distinct SIMD registers separately. And you see this here, FMLA, these four FMLA instructions, they accumulate into Z4, Z5, Z6, and Z7. Okay, these are four independent dependency change, e uh, chains. Each of these FMLAs has its own separate dependency chain, which is unchanged from before, it's nine cycles per iteration. However, we have four of these. So the overall average latency gets reduced because we're doing more work in these nine cycles, so to speak. This is the benefit of choosing a C that is not the minimum. And for A64FX, this is really a good thing. So here, um, this is the second part, the lower part of the Osaka output, where it actually gives us all the um, dependency change it, it has found. In the output itself, it only reports one with nine cycles, this one. But here in the, in the lower block, it gives us each dependency chain separately. And there are actually four of these with nine cycles each, okay? So we do have the loop carry dependency still, but we get more work done in these nine cycles because we can overlap four independent dependency chains within the pipeline. And Christy will show you later um, the positive impact of this change. Okay, now finally, I will not go into detail here. You can read it up in the paper. This is the code balance of cell C sigma. It has to be modified from the original code balance of CRS. The main factors are that now we have more traffic potentially for the matrix and the right-hand side vector uh, and, and the column index, sorry, because we have potentially a fill-in. If beta is smaller than one, then we have to augment traffic by a factor of one over beta. So the matrix data and column index 
get multiplied by one over beta. Um, the left-hand side update, 16 bytes, reading and writing, divided by NNZR. Since NNZR is now potentially also larger by a factor of one over beta, we have this factor of beta here up front. We have the chunk index. Um, that's actually a good thing in Celsius Sigma. You don't have to store a row pointer for every row. You only have to store an index for every chunk, which is like C times less data. So you save a little bit of data. It's not 20, it's 16 plus four over C, okay? And, um, oh, sorry, I should change this. This is uh, not applicable anymore. So this is our final formula. And you see that every one of these terms has a beta in it. And even the alpha has a beta because the optimal alpha is now beta divided by NNZR, where NZR is the original number of non-zeros per row for the matrix. Okay, so what we do then is what I explained in the first part, when we measure the actual code balance, of course, we have to measure the traffic, but in order to get the work right, since we're doing more work in the padded scheme, we have to use the amount of work that is applicable for the CRS format. So do not count the work on the zeros as actual work. That's a typical mistake that people could potentially make, okay? So in measuring the, the, the code balance, only count the useful number of flops, excluding the zero padding. All right, so wrapping it up, SBMVM for A64, FX. We have fundamental problems with, a, with CRS on this processor because we have a short reduction loop with a loop pattern dependency. We have horizontal ads, which are really expensive, and we have an extremely high ad latency. And this is why CRS does not saturate the bandwidth. It looks good because it looks scalable, but it's actually slow code. Celsius Sigma mitigates these problems okay, by allowing to overlap um, pipeline bubbles with independent um, instruction chains and allowing for a SIMD compatible execution. <clears throat> and you don't need horizontal ads and you don't need to accumulate across a register at the end. Um, it doesn't hurt on standard multi-core GPUs, of course. If you use it on a standard multi-core GPU, it's no different from CRS typically, it doesn't get much gain. It's also very good for GPUs. So it's, it's really good, a good candidate for a, a, a global um, a performance portable format if you, if you like. Drawbacks. Um, the sorting modifies the right-hand side axis. So your alpha depends on the sorting range sigma that may be a downside. And secondly, um, the zero padding introduces some overhead. And there's some trade-off between choosing a large sigma and having, um, uh, having less overhead for the beta. Okay, that's it for Celsius Sigma. And I'm now handing over to Thomas for the performance counterpart. Yep. Oh, sorry. Any questions? Let me look at the chat. Yes, yeah, Celsius Sigma paper. Yeah, that's the preprint, but it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so welcome to the second part of the performance tool. So liquid um, introduction. Um, now we are talking about liquid perf counter. It's the, the wrapper for hardware performance counting um, on all different architectures. Uh, with, and with different measurement modes and so on. <clears throat> so th the first thing is that often these uh, bigger tools like HPC Toolkit and, and how they are all called um, are often overkill. Sometimes you just need a, a, a short introduction about what is the, what is the code properties, um, is it saturating bandwidth and so on. Um, and for that, for this course overview, um, liquid perf counter is, is perfect. Um, it provides different measurement modes. So the normal end-to-end -end measurement, so start counters, start the application and stop and evaluate the counters in the end. Um, then there's the marker API, which is like code instrumentation added by the user to measure only a region of the code. Um, these two modes I will cover today in the talk, uh, the stethoscope and timeline mode. I won't cover stethoscope is like looking from the outside what is uh, happening on the chip. Um, and timeline mode is like time-based sampling, like in second range and so on. Um, working with hardware counters can be uh, quite annoying because they are changing between architectures. Um, they have different names, different meanings. Uh, they count differently and so on. Um, for that, Liquid provides pre-configured and uh, also extendable by you metric groups. 
Uh, you can get a whole list of those with liquid perf counter minus A. Uh, here on the right side, it's an excerpt of all the groups provided on uh, Okami. So like branch for the branch prediction stuff and uh, measuring the clock frequency um, and most important, probably these flops groups. So for double position, single position, half position, as well as the memory bandwidth and the L2 um, cache utilization. Um, to run it, it's quite similar to the liquid pin calls. So you write liquid perf counter, um, then you with minus G, you tell which uh, set of events should be measured and which metrics should be evaluated. And with uh, C, you specify the uh, CPU selection, similar to that we did it with uh, liquid pin. And then the application, this is the wrapper mode. It prints some, some basic header in the beginning, and then the program output, and then these uh, tables. At first, it, uh, so here's a group one and L2. So it, it tells you exactly which group it is. You can could have, uh, add multiple groups on the command line with some switching and so on. So for that is documentation, but you can have multiple of those tables for your application. Um, in the first part, it's the, the raw counters. So the raw events that are measured by liquid and which counter they are using. Um, we get these values for each of the hardware threads we used. So here we used socket one. Um, so it liquid, um, checks out which hardware threads are 0 to 3 on socket 1 and uses those. So that's the second CMG, the first four cores. Um, and then there is some statistics table. So it prints like the sum, average, and so on over all the threads. Um, I, I skipped it here. And then there's the metric table, which is commonly the most interesting table for, for the users. Um, which contains like the derived metrics based on the counts we, we used, uh, so we measured here. Um, so in order for with these two um, raw counters, we derive, for example, the L1, L2 bandwidth and data volume. So yeah, the derived metrics and the raw groups. Um, so this is quite simple. There's nothing, not much, uh, magic going on um, when you use the wrapper mode, just specify which course and which group um, and the application. Um, if you are interested in a specific region like the SPMB kernel, um, you can add marker API around it. It restricts the, the measurements to, the, to these code regions. Um, the, the instrumentation in your code does not specify which events should be measured. This is all happening on the outside. So by liquid perf counter, you can still use this minus G, L2, and so on um, to specify what should be measured. Inside the code, there is only these, uh, these macros. So we include the header, um, call liquid marker in it in some serial region. Um, and some and liquid marker close also in some serial region, commonly like the beginning and the end of the main function is a good place for that. Um, and then we use liquid marker start and stop around the region of interest. This should be called by each of the threads that are executed because they are um, reading the counters themselves. Um, you can have multiple of those regions as shown here. You can also overlap them, you can nest them. Um, if, if a region is uh, executed multiple times, the, the counts are simply summed up um, and we record the call count for each of those regions. Thomas, a quick question. Do you have, yeah. a, Fortran, do you have a Fortran API or would it be okay to just wrap it? Uh, see here, around? there's a tutorial Fortran marker API. So the Fortran API Fantastic. is included in the, the normal liquid package, you just have to activate. So you have to tell it to build it, um, but it's already included. There are other um, APIs like for Python, Lua, Julia, and so on, um, which are not part of the base uh, source code. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. So. In, in order to use that um, with uh, OpenMP Parallel 4, 
what you have to do is you have to split up the OpenMP parallel and the uh, work sharing construct, so the OMP4, um, to squeeze the markers between the parallel region start and the work sharing construct. Uh, I'm not sure whether I have a slide for that. Currently, I have slides showing how to um, add these um, in, in, in different cases. Um, I have definitely a slide which with code and, and, and markers on it. So um, the next slides. Um, in order to build it, um, you have to specify this minus D liquid perfmon while compilation. This activates the macros, otherwise they are simply empty and you can add them to your code. Um, and compile it without the marker support by leaving out this, this defined. When you run it, you use liquid perf counter and add the minus M switch to enable the, the markers. We see that in the next slides. So to compile it, um, we, we set the include dir and the, the define so that the macros are activated. Um, we link it, of course, we need the, the library dir to the, um, for that and link with the liquid library. And then we call it um, with C, so the CPU selection mask, the, the group or the event set uh, minus M and the application. And then you get a separate block of output. So these tables with raw and, and marker and, and derived metrics for each of the regions um, you have specified. Of course, the marker API can have overhead. So um, it's, it's called, it's like, intercepting your application flow um, with instrumentation. Don't call it too frequently. Um, on our systems, this liquid ink dia and liquid lib dia is managed by the module system so that it is, um, it's easy to, to always use these um, variables in, in make files and so on. Um, so this part, uh, path has changed. This is the, the module um, provided by by, by Kami, by Sony Group. Um, if you want to use the, the ones uh, I saw the sourced uh, stuff I added in the chat, it defines already the liquid ink gear, liquid lip gear. So it's working properly. Um, on Okami, you have to disable this uh, performance co pilot, I think it is called, um, by using this, this perf alloc minus D or, an, uh, or put it in the background. Um, this disables. The, the perf event counting from the system and allows you to use the, the counters for your own measurements. So what should you look like, uh, should look for when, when running a code? Um, so here's some example uh, architecture with different um, metrics at different locations. So between core and L1, you can measure the load and store operations. There's commonly no data traffic measurements between core and L1 possible, um, mainly because the, the width of the accesses is not known or not counted. Um, so we can we know that there's a load in the store, but not whether it was a AVX or SVE load or a scalar load. Between the cache levels and between cache levels and memory, you can get the data volumes and bandwidths um, to, to get an impression how good your code act, uh, runs in the caches uh, and how much memory is needed and, and bandwidth and, and whether you're bandwidth bound or not. Inside the core, of course, useful work. So mostly flops in HPC cases, uh, instruction throughput. You can also do instruction breakdowns, like how many floating point operations, how many branch instructions, uh, low stores and so on have been executed and also like clock frequency. All these metrics can be measured with these groups, uh, MemDP, MemSP. So this is like a combination of memory measurements with the flops DP group. Same here for the a single position, branch for the branch prediction stuff, data for the load store operations and the load store ratio, and L2 for the um, L2 mem, uh, L1, L2 traffic. Um, as I said, here is an example. Um, so here, as you see, it is already split up in two parts. So we have this um, Pragma OMP parallel, open that, um, and then we have the work sharing construct in between. So in the, in the, in the, in the, in the round loop, so we execute that multiple times. That's a triangular matrix vector multiplication. 
Um, here's a picture of that. Um, and that's basically the code. The code does not really matter. It's more about the instrumentation we do with it. So in order to add the markers, we add the liquid marker in it in, uh, in the serial region. Um, same for liquid marker close. And inside this OP parallel, we add the uh, marker start before the work sharing construct, so before the OMP4, and the stop afterwards. And it will um, count now, so it will show in the results that the count is equal to the rounds, so the call count. This is the same thing in Fortran, so um, not much different. Um, instead of the header uh, include, you do an use, um, and you, you call the different um, liquid marker functions. So um, here is an example uh, I ran on, on Okami um, with this code. Uh, we have to forcefully um, use the uh, active weight policy to see the effect I want to show here. Um, commonly, that's not the uh, default weight policy on Okami. Um, so um, you probably won't see that. Um, we run on the first three cores, use the L2, L1, L2, um, data traffic, and use the markers. We have added on the last slides. And we see here we have the region compute. So you get the name of the region in this, this output. And we measure the L2 group. Here we see the course, the runtime, and it's only called once in our case. So rounds was probably one. Um, and then we see the results here for the, for the raw counts. I'm showing only the raw counts here. And we see that we have rising, uh, increasing instruction counts um, with the thread number. So the, the hardware thread zero does um, the least amount of instructions and hardware thread two does the most of them. Um, why it is like that, um, the, the retired instructions might be misleading in this case because the threads are waiting in this active barrier in the end, uh, which, call, which executes a lot of instructions. So mostly no op instructions but they are all counted as an uh, executed instruction or retired instruction. And that's why you get pictures like that. So the, the last thread is always doing the most work because it waited the most time in the barrier. Um, what we have to do here, we, have, we need to measure the actual work. So the flops in this case. Um, so here we use uh, the, the SVE instructions. The problem is that uh, we cannot see, uh, cannot measure how wide this SV instruction was. So if you do an SV 128 instruction, it is simply counted as SV instruction. It, it's not known how, how wide it is. And it's also not known to liquid afterwards. So when calculating the metrics. But if you do that, if you measure this um, floating point uh, SV instructions retired, you see that the first thread is doing always the most part of the work. And you see this uh, nice uh, linear um, decrease um, of floating point operations as we uh, expected when looking at the structure of the code. Um, we can change this quite simple. So this load imbalance by changing the, the OMP schedule to static and using a chunk size 16. So every thread gets a smaller chunk. Um, and thus does not wait that long in the barrier. Um, we have no imbalance anymore. And it's also faster. Um, I've not shown this uh, performance graph, um, but you can see that it's, uh, it's faster. Um, as a, a summary and conclusion of the whole the hardware performance monitoring stuff, um, it's only useful if you know what you're looking for. So it's, it's mostly does not work out to measure what, uh, whatever group liquid provides and, and get some meaning out of that. You should have some mind model of the execution before and try to validate that. Um, for us, we mainly use resource-based metrics. Um, so like cache line transferred and work executed, cycles, instructions, and so on. Uh, so these the instructions like CPI and something like cache misses, cats hit, cache hits might be misleading, um, especially if like prefetchers are active, the cache hit miss ratio is like mostly useless. 
Um, important to know is that processor work is not equal to user work. So as we have seen, um, waiting time in libraries uh, might uh, may cause a lot of instructions and we don't see that in the user code. Um, also, there are um, operations that happen out, uh, at hardware level, which are not part of the assembly code. Um, and, so, and so it's not completely invisible for the user and the, the system before that this uh, stuff happens, like the write allocates or read, of, read for ownerships uh, for store misses. Um, we use it uh, to validate performance models. So um, we, we try to establish performance models about codes and, and validate that using hardware performance counters. Um, yeah. I'm leaving out the comment about the, the roof line. So that's, that's it from my side. Any questions about liquid perf counter and the Mark API? That, um, in, can we go back to your market API example? Because um, it sure. wasn't completely clear to me precisely where the uh, market is. Quadrant OC. That's, either is fine. OK. So the, the market init and the market close is part of the serial region. Um, so this initializes the library and this writes out the exam, uh, the, the results to a file, which is later picked up by liquid perf counter. Um, and inside this parallel uh, region, we call the start and the stop markers. Okay, so the, basically the parallel region is creating essentially the threads. And yeah. Means Okay. Yeah. And, and since we use liquid perf counter minus capital C, so here in this example, it means that the threads are pinned to the cores here in the CPU selection. And then each thread is running on a distinct core here. So okay. as soon as this parallel region starts, each thread is placed on a distinct CPU core. Okay. Yeah. You could in, even in open a parallel region just for the purpose of starting the markers and then close it and open it again because usually the threads are still alive. They just put a sleep in between. Okay. Yeah. So if you're calling some external library function like MKL or some other math library, um, the, the main recommendation is to open a parallel region, just do the liquid marker start and close it afterwards, the parallel region, call the external library call and then do a pragma OMP parallel again with the marker stopped. Oh, okay, very elegant. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. The, the compute is there a keyword, or you just give a random name there? Or is there? You can a use a random string here. Um, it is only used for identification of uh, of the markers afterwards in the output. So not, no, not really. What, it, what really happens under the hood is it creates a hash table from string to the results. So, and it, the, these strings identify the region. So you can have here a different region. And as soon as you go to compute again, it get, fetches from the hash table, the results and, and keeps working on them. Okay. And the out, you can then can get an, you get an output for every region with the label that you gave it here in the in the argument of start and stop. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. And if you have 10 regions, you get 10 times this output, one for each region. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, welcome. Then I'm stopping. Oh, it's Christy's turn again for a hands-on. Yes. <laughs> okay. So part two of hands-on. So right now, uh, I hope that the liquid installation should be fixed. So basically in chat, Thomas has posted a, a sourcing command 
So let's see. So I'll post again. So please use that to source the liquid library. And yes, so for part two, we have all the materials in hands-on part two. So the slides are here. Okay, so if you want to work with us, so follow this slide. Okay, so in this hands-on, what I would do is I would introduce the Celsius Sigma code, which is coded here in this yeah, benchmark. So, and we will check the performance with the Celsius Sigma code and compare it with CRS, so which we did. Uh, so CRS, we saw it didn't saturate and we will see in this exercise whether how Celsius Sigma looks on A64 FX. So first of all, the Celsius Sigma code, it's in source SPMV A64 FX and cell 32. So here we uh, specify the chunk size to be 32, okay? So as Georg mentioned, uh, C is chosen as a multiple of vector length and on A64 FX, we have a vector length of eight for double precision, right? And this means uh, it's four times eight, right? So the multiple is four, okay, for this specific case. So we wrote the code in intrinsic because if you write the code in high level C, uh, the compiler has real difficulty to understand it. Um, so the current compilers for A64 FX has real difficulties to understand it. Uh, uh, I think, I, as far as I remember correctly, Fujitsu compiler might do a good job, but the GCC compiler didn't do a good job in creating the, uh, yeah, creating the proper code from this high level code. So that's why we used the intrinsics. And here you see the intrinsics basically for cell 32. Basically, this is the innermost loop and yeah, with the ARM ACLE intrinsics, they have an elegant manner to hide, uh, to avoid reminder loops. And this is done with this do and while, for example. And basically here you see, we have unrolled all. It's eight times four. That's why we have four times eight wide load instructions to load the uh, data from metrics. And similarly for column indexes, and then we do a gather um, based on the column index, right? So, so we do a gather based on the column index and we, to the X vector. So that's the right-hand side Y vector. And finally we add up the results, okay? So this is basically the Celsius Sigma code. So you can have a look when you have time. And so now let's run it. So previously for CRS, uh, for a single core, if you check the performance, it was 1.28 gigaflops per second uh, with HPCG uh, metrics of dimension 128 cube. Now, uh, in, your, in the executable, we ran the CRS GCC, right? So for Celsius Sigma, we run the other executable, which is called SPMV Celsius GCC, okay? And we can do the same command instead of CRS GCC, what I do is cell C GCC. Right. And here you see that the performance improves uh, by a factor greater than two X when you use cell C Sigma. Yeah, this is, uh, this is as Georg mentioned due to, uh, due to uh, um, because you don't have this uh, loop carry dependencies and also you don't have this expensive horizontal add. Right? So you uh, gain in single core performance. Now let's see whether this code saturates the main memory bandwidth. So similar to the previous one, so we scale it in one socket. So it's basically, I have a script for this. So scaling cell C dot SH. So basically what I do is similar, a closed manner pinning. So liquid pin dash C zero. And so zero to, uh, I scale, uh, let me put it for other else it will take a lot of time. Let's do it for only one socket. So 12 cores, so C zero to 11. So I didn't specify any socket because zero to 11, I know it's on the first socket. So it's, it is equivalent if I specify as zero, zero to 11, or if I specify S one, it's on the second socket, but it shouldn't matter because the main memory bandwidth of socket zero or socket 
uh, or the CMG0 or CMG1 is basically the same, right? So let's run it. Uh, yeah. Hopefully it runs. Ah, yeah. Yes, so here you see the performance of the single code. Uh, single core is two times higher. And here with second thread, it's the speed up is almost two X. This is good, three and so on. But yeah, so once you see, let's go. Okay, but uh, what we see is the performance increases for a certain time, but uh, the speed up starts to decrease. So this means there is some saturation effect, right? So yeah, we see with nine threads, for example, you get almost eight X speed up. Okay, so here you see, for example, with 11 threads, for example, you get only, uh, yeah, with 12 threads, for example, only 10 X speed up, right? But with CRS, you got 12 X speed up. But speed up is not the entire picture, right? Because if you see the performance, the performance, uh, if you observe this and compare it with CRS, you would get a picture similar to this. So what you see here, the blue line is the CRS code, which we did before. For HPC G matrix and with Celsius Sigma, what happens is the single core is uh, performance is higher. And as you increase the number of threads at uh, after a certain number of threads, it starts to saturate the main memory bandwidth. And if you observe closely, you would see that it, uh, it somehow reaches close to some saturation because if you see even the speed up, you see, okay, it doesn't have like 12X speed up with 12 threads. So there, some saturation is coming on, but it's it's a weak saturation, okay, for this uh, for this setting right now. Uh, so always be careful that speed up is not the entire picture. So you have to observe the runtime or the performance because uh, higher speed up doesn't mean anything, right? So yeah, this is one lesson learned. And so now, can we improve this? So this is a practical advice. So on A64 FX, huge pages uh, makes a big difference. And to use this huge pages with Fujitsu compiler, so uh, when you have Fujitsu compiler, you can link it with libmpg library. So if you use Fujitsu compiler by default, it already links it uh, under the hood. So you don't need to do it. But when you use other compilers like GCC, which we do right now, you have to link with uh, uh, the libmpg library. And if you do this, uh, uh, so let's see how to do this. So to do this, what you can do is you can tweak the configuration. So you can go to include gcc.mk. And what you need to do to link is basically, you. this is a uh, library which you need to enable at linking and it basically it does some tracing, for example. And basically you need to, when linking, you have to provide this line of code, right? And enable, and yeah, and enable libmpg, which is, oh, sorry. So yeah, enable libmpg, so lmpg. So if you do this and type make, let's also make it verbose, the make, so we can see where it's being linked. Yes, so you see here, for example, when linking, I provide this command and also I tell, okay, link it with LMPG. So on A64FX, this makes real big difference. So if I run this again, for example, with single core, for example, so without huge pages, it was 2.83 gigaflops per second. Yeah, now the performance again increases. And this is not just a slight increase, but this is a significant increase in performance when you use huge pages with a 64 text. So more on this uh, can be found here. So we observe that when you link with huge pages, some cache hierarchies can overlap and stuff. So more on this can be found in this paper. So which is already accepted for, yeah. 
so basically in, in general it's a good idea to use or uh, to link with this library for streaming codes and yeah this is, comes back to the question what happens when you have uh, more than one node for example if you need to uh, run it on the entire node which consists of multiple numbered domains if you use this uh, let's see if you just run this so basically with one cmg i got almost 30 gigaflops per second right what is my mouse work anymore okay uh, yeah i got almost 30 gigaflops per second on one cmg so with four cmg i would expect something around 120 gigaflops per second right but yeah the performance decreases if you don't uh, so if you just run it with 48 cores the performance decreases the problem here is that uh, with fujitsu compiler uh, as was mentioned previously in the discussion that uh, it doesn't use by default the first touch policy. Uh, it uses something, uh, it prepages all the uh, allocation to the first CMG, okay, so, so to CMG zero. So in order to enable first touch, you have to, uh, when using Fujitsu compiler, you have to export this environmental variable. So if you do this and run, uh, Okay. Okay, now it worked. Okay. And I think there was some more space or something. Okay, now if you run it again, you observe almost 100 gigaflops per second. Uh, yeah, which is uh, pretty close to our 120 gigaflops per second. Uh, yeah, with four CMGs. Yeah, I basically, I was wondering why it was 100. It should have been more. Yeah, and it's more actually, 114 gigaflops per second. Yeah, you see uh, when you go from one CMG to four CMGs, you get almost 120 gigaflops per second, right? So be careful when linking with Fujitsu's MPG library. So to use huge pages. Uh, and if you, you can run the same script again to check the performance. And what you would see is with uh, if you use huge pages in addition to the cell C sigma code, that is this yellow line, you can observe clear saturation. So there's a strong saturation because the single core performance has improved. And now the performance can scale until it hits the main memory bandwidth. And you see clearly this strong saturation. Okay. And yeah, but basically, um, at the end, uh, if you if you are using the one socket or full uh, full node, it doesn't matter because at the end, even without using huge pages, in this case for this particular matrix, you reach almost thirty gigaflops per second. So you almost saturate the main memory bandwidth. But one should add there are worse matrices than HPCG. <laughs> exactly. So there are worse matrices than HPCG, where you uh, where huge pages might have significant impact. Right. <laughs> True. Okay, so now let us, so we saw, okay, there might be saturation with main memory bandwidth here. So let's measure with liquid whether it actually saturates the main memory bandwidth, okay? So for this, um, what we need to do is insert liquid markers. So this was explained just now by Thomas. So basically I have already inserted the markers. Uh, basically, uh, you see, I call, let me highlight it. Okay. Uh, I include liquid.h, right? And this, uh, wait, okay, wait. Uh, okay. And in the main, uh, in the main function, first call I do is basically, uh, uh, first call which I do is liquid marker in it. So I initialize the liquid marker and in the code what I do is basically for benchmarking. Let's see. Yeah, I call a macro called perf run where the SPMV kernel is executed. Okay, so let's see the perf run macro. And in the perf run macro, uh, what I see is I have a liquid marker start 
and liquid market stock. And this is also the perfect example, uh, like what Thomas explained. Uh, for example, if you have a library call or call which you can't uh, modify, for example, you can also insert liquid marker star. And what you need to do is just uh, make sure that liquid marker star is called within a parallel region. So it need not be the same parallel region for the kernel and the liquid marker star. Okay, so I do this separately. So I invoke a parallel region and call liquid marker start and I close the parallel region. And then I call the kernel SPMV and uh, the parallelization for SPMV is done within the kernel. Okay, so uh, pragma OMP parallel four is done within this kernel again. And at the end for stopping, I again do it in a parallel region. And at the end of the main, I close or finalize all the um, liquid calls by using liquid marker close. And at this point, it should print the report. Okay, so much for, explain, uh, for the code. And yes, so we saw how to insert the liquid markers. Now, yeah, this is the new source me. So you can source this link. And if you do this correctly, you should uh, you should probably be able to use liquid. Just have a try. So this, yeah. So just have a try if this works now. So if you source this correctly, you sh everything should work. Also, it would be advisable to use it in a fresh shell. So not with module load liquid, which you did before. So open a fresh shell and uh, source this. And after this, as Thomas mentioned, the uh, performance uh, Copilot is running on the background and we have to stop this. So let me source this first. And I have to stop the performance Copilot, which I do got this command. And now what I can do is basically I can copy this line of code. And so basically what it does is it, yeah, only should do static num threads. And basically it's similar to liquid pin. So instead of liquid pin, I use liquid perf counter. And dash M is, uh, I specify dash M so that only regions, uh, marked regions are counted. And I want to measure the main memory bandwidth. And for this, I use the mem group in liquid. And yeah, I specify only on one socket, so zero to 11. Copy. Right. Yeah, the good thing about liquid is, uh, that's not good. What happened? Space between dash and C. Ah, uh, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. Uh, remember to specify capital C because then only the liquid perf counter will pin your course as it runs without pinning the course. So if you want to pin, use capital C. If you don't want to pin, you can use small c. But we want to pin, so we use capital C. Okay. And on one core, I get, yeah, this was also observed before. On one socket, I get 30 gigaflops per second for Celsius Sigma code. And let's make it smaller, right. And what you see here is the table for SPMV A64FX because this was the region name that I specified. And Yes, so the first table is the runtime and the call count. And the second table is the row counters and their statistics. So the uh, statistics, statistics of the row counters. So the row events, so not counters, so the row events. Uh, so the, their statistics. And finally, this is, uh, this is the thing, um, this is the table which mo most of you might be interested in. So these two tables. Uh, something, yeah, for high level users, these are more important, right? So the good thing about liquid is liquid uh, fuses or combines this uh, row events to derived metrics like memory bandwidth, memory read bandwidth, memory data volume and stuff like that. And so here in this table, you get the values for each thread, the derived values for each thread. So yeah, 
uh, here, for example, you see the memory data volume of hardware thread zero or core zero is 17 gigabytes and for core one and so on. And in the final, I see the statistics. For memory bandwidth, the important value is the sum of all the sum of the bandwidth, which is uh, uh, drawn by all the cores. And this is reported as 210 gigabytes per second. And this is pretty close to uh, what you can actually, so the achievable stream memory bandwidth on one CMG of A64FX. So I think with stream, you get something around 215 to 16 or something, but this is pretty close. So you see that our SPMB code with Celsius Sigma actually saturates the main memory bandwidth, right? So this is a clear indication. And now, uh, for performance modeling, you can also derive code balance, for example. So Georg mentioned, for example, uh, the code balance is nothing but the total data volume divided by the performance, right? So what you can do is I can divide the, oh no, sorry, total, total bandwidth. bandwidth. Sorry, sorry, total bandwidth divided by the uh, total performance. So let me copy the total bandwidth. This is in megabytes per second. I so convert into gigabytes per second and I divide by giga clocks per second. So we get giga, uh, so we get bytes per flop. And we see in this case, I get almost 6.8 bytes per flop for this HPCG matrix. And uh, this is pretty close to what you would observe. Uh, yeah, what you would observe with uh, yeah, the optimal. So the optimal code balance is pretty much close. So let's see what is the optimal code balance. Yeah, so optimal code balance is basically six by beta and beta in this case is close to one because there is less, very less filling because this is almost, yeah, there is no filling, filling it's almost one. So we have one by beta, let's put it beta itself. And in the numerator we have, oh, sorry. Uh, we have, so six by beta plus four alpha, right? Uh, and alpha, the most optimal case as Georg told is beta by NNZR for um, Celsius Sigma. And what is the third term? <laughs> I have to check. It should be, yeah, let me put it here itself. It should be 20, yeah. I think it should be this one, right? Uh, 10 by NNZR. So uh, yeah, beta is almost one, NNZR in this case is HPCG matrix, so 27 neighbors to so 27 non zeros per row, and yeah, optimal code balance is 6.51. And this is pretty close to 6.81, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you don't have uh, eight plus two, but two by C. So I forgot to divide by eight plus two by 32 because that's our value. So yeah, 6.44. So this value, so you will see the measured balance is 6.81 divided by the optimal, it's a deviation of just 5% or 6% to say. So HPCG code, it's good and it saturates the main memory bandwidth. Okay, so it's not always this easy. So HPCG code or DLR, uh, so HPCG matrix or DLR1 matrix, or there are lots of matrices where this works really well. But for example, in publicly available matrix collection, there are some matrices um, that don't work very well. For example, like KKT power from suit sparse matrix collection. Mm, they, it has some problems. So if you try to run KKT power, for example, you can run this by specify dash M. And I have copied everything to, I have updated the links. So let's see what is the new link. I've 
okay it's this link so so you can't in this executable you can specify in uh, as an option the metrics so you can provide a path to the metrics so if you don't provide the executable does with hpcg metrics so if you you can provide a, also a metrics with dash m so i specify kkt power okay so in on a64 fx on one socket normally if it saturates the bandwidth that you should attain on for spnv close to 30 gigaflops per second this is also what we observed with hpcg code but let's see with kkt power well, Okay, so with KKT power, I achieve almost 5x, uh, uh, no, more than 5x actually, uh, speed down in the code. Okay, so I get only 4.8 gigaflops per second. And also with liquid, you can see, okay, I draw only 73 gigabytes per second. Okay, so actually, theoretically, you can attain 220 gigabytes per second, but yeah, I attain only. 73 gigabytes per second with this matrix. And yeah, sorry, this is this is not F, but this is beta actually. So you, what you can also observe is the beta value is quite high. Uh, so not quite high, so quite low. So 0 0.47. So uh, for HPCG, it was close to one, which is ideal. But if it's close, uh, if it's well below one, this is problematic because this means there is a lot of filling, okay? So this is one uh, problem that you can see immediately. And if you measure the uh, if you measure the code balance, for example, by dividing this one divided by, so dividing bandwidth divided by performance, you will see if you compare it with the uh, with the optimal value, you would see that this is more than ten. You would have more than ten percent deviation. Okay, so. Alpha, uh, so there is some alpha effect because there is 10% deviation from the model or the optimal model, but this doesn't explain the speed down of more than 5x, okay? So there is something else also. So to see this, what you can do is you can specify, for example, with this executable, the stat, so the option called stat. So basically what it does is it collects the statistics of the metrics. So statistics in the sense it collects how many rows, for example, have uh, uh, some certain number of non-zeros per row. Okay, so it's a histogram, for example, what it collects with this. So let's collect this for KKT power, right? And here you see um, on the left column, that is the first column, the number of non-zeros per row, and how many rows have this num many number of non-zeros per row. Okay. So what is the length of the row? For, so 61 rows have uh, NNZR equal to one. And yeah, most of the NNZR uh, or most of the rows are having only three non-zeros per row. So you can see 50% of the rows have only three non-zeros per row. But since this non-zeros per row is only three, they contribute only to 20% of the work or 20% of the non-zeros, okay? So this is one thing you have to keep in mind. And you see that this spectrum is wide. For, so for example, if you did this for HPCG metrics, most of the rows would, or 99% of the rows would be in uh, with 27. So and with an NZR 27 for HPCG metrics. But in this case, you see a wide spectrum of, uh, so there is uneven distribution in the length of rows. And what's interesting is also, for example, uh, there are some rows, so only 9,000 rows with length of 62, right? But uh, they contribute only to 0.44% of the number of rows, but they contribute to almost 4% of the total amount of work because they are long rows, okay? So this rows pretty much matter because it depends whether these rows are scheduled to different cores or are they scheduled to uh, for example, one core. If these all rows are scheduled to one core, to one core, then you have a load imbalance. And this is the case, for example, with KKT power matrix. For example, I have uh, generated the statistics and I have collected the statistics with different number of rows, and I have plotted this 
but excel let's see let's see when it opens okay so for example with nnz equal to 3 so rows with length of 3 you see so this is the start uh, rows and uh, these are towards the right you see the end rows and so uh, there are some rows which don't have uh, row length of 3 in the middle but yeah uh, so there is some load imbalance uh, problems here. But what you see, the most significant impact comes from 62 because what happens is only the first rows, so the rows towards the left, so x-axis is uh, plotted with increasing amount of rows. And so only the first rows, for example, have uh, this, uh, this rows, which have this large NNZR. So basically what happens is the Core zero, for example, has a lot of work compared to the other core. And this you can observe also from the liquid runs. For example, you see if you compare the data volume between different threads, for example, this is core zero. So for core zero, I see I draw 10 gigabytes. While for other cores, you see I draw much less uh, traffic. Okay, you see this load imbalance here. And you see with the last cores, for example, they don't, they draw only, yeah, very marginal compared to, so almost 5x lower. Okay, so more than 5x lower traffic for the last threads. Right, so there is a load imbalance. So what you can do to fix load imbalance to a certain extent is what Thomas showed uh, with a triangular matrix vector multiplication. So for example, you can specify a chunk size. So you can split or you can make the chunk size smaller and give it to different threads. This will work uh, to a certain extent. Let's see. So previously, remember we had 4.8 gigaflops per second. Let's see with the new one. Right. Running. Yes. So now we improve the performance to 6.5 gigaflops per second. So you can play around with the scheduling strategy and maybe you can find a much better uh, scheduling strategy, right? Uh, so yeah, you can play around. So the problem, main problem here is the loading balance um, for KKT power metrics. And still with, even with this uh, value, you can't saturate the main memory bandwidth. So you attain almost 50%, but not much. So we will have to, yeah, look into uh, dig further to see what's the problem again, okay? Right. So there are some questions in the chat, let me see. Okay, uh, basically that's it, basically for, for um, yeah, demo. So if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. So Chris, Christy, could you maybe recap what you had to do to get huge pages working? And could you also comment on where the benefits coming from? Is it just from the TLB or does it have some impact on cache conflicts? Yes, so basically uh, to enable huge pages, what you need to do is basically uh, link uh, with the script. Right, so it's uh, on Okami also the same. Uh, so also on Fujitsu, uh, so on the Fugaku supercomputer, it's the same path actually. So it comes with the Fujitsu compiler. So you can link with the script using this command. And yeah, also specify the path to the library and just, okay. yeah, that's it basically. That's it basically. You don't need to do any other changes because this, is, uh, this traces the calls to malloc and stuff and basically, yeah, it intercepts these calls and it modifies it. Uh, okay. Is it possible to do that with an LD preload or we have to do it on the link stack? Um, I think it should be possible, but I'm not sure. So uh, okay. uh, yeah, but uh, check in the documentation because I, uh, I, I found this documentation with the uh, Fugaku supercomputer. So the, it was this one. So it worked also here also. So okay, maybe yeah. oh, thank you. Yeah. And it and puts more than in the on the huge pages than just the allocations. So it puts also the text uh, section and, and data section of the binary on the uh, two megabyte pages. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So here, if you, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it changes from 64 kilobyte to two megabyte pages. 
it is, but yeah, it could text section, that's true. Um, yeah, and, and what it does basically, yeah, we can't pinpoint to exactly why this is happening, but let's see, where's that paper? Okay. So basically what we observed was, for example, if you use huge pages, um, the data transfer between the caches can overlap. Like for example, here, uh, this was in the paper, for example, you see the last column. So if you see my pointer, uh, so here yep. it's the memory yeah. transfer uh, and this is the L2 transfer and you see the L2 and memory transfers can perfectly overlap if you use huge pages, okay? But if you don't use huge pages, um, they don't overlap to some certain extent, for example. So this is one of the reasons why your single core performance uh, boosts when you use huge pages. Right. But I can't pinpoint why this is happening. <laughs> yeah. But this is the effect what's happening. <laughs> but I can't pinpoint why this is happening. Right. Interesting. Thank you. So these pictures are actually a visualization of the ECM performance model for this machine. So as you might have guessed, we could go on for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fascinating stuff. <laughs> My group's being uncharacteristically shy. <laughs> so the, the MPG library is dynamic, right? So presumably you're going to need an, an R path or um, LD library path to make it work. Or, no, or does that link a script no, make, make that? No, basically you don't need it because it, uh, it's done with this linking script basically. Basically you just link it like this and it works basically. You don't need to do any other changes. You don't need to do some, any, any other changes. But the only thing you need to take care is by default then it's not, uh, the first touch policy will not work. That's the only thing that you have to take care of. All right, right. So yeah, yeah the, the minus T is the script, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes, okay. exactly. Minus T is the script, right. Are there any other questions? Yeah, so I could go on for a, a long. <laughs> there is other stuff like uh, advanced, like you can use sector caches for SPMV, and also you can use reordering and stuff. More on this, you can find. There are some slides, uh, so you can find it. The, the, so actually, you mentioned the sector cache. It, in the documentation I've seen, it's only accessible at a high level if you use the Fujitsu compiler, otherwise you've got to delve down into low level stuff. Have you asked, oh, okay, okay. Yes, I was wondering if you'd find a way to use it from an, a different uh, compiler. So Thomas is working on it right now, that I can test. I'm, I'm currently writing the Linux kernel modules for sector cache, hardware barrier and so on. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you very much. So that will be integrated to lib, right? right? Yeah. Oh, it's a separate project probably. Yeah. Um, but yes, so usable with Liquid, but extra project with all the kernel modules and like the user space libraries. Yeah, do you have any more information about the um, hardware barriers? Well, I, I know how they work, um, but yeah, whatever you wanna know about them. So they are only per CMG, um, over CMGs you have to do like a manual barrier or your own barrier um, and it's a separate register so it's separate registers in for for each cmg um, the, the, the only documentation i've seen about is the hpc extension for exactly the and, and there is everything in it's just like not written well okay right okay yeah so the whole logic is inside this this documentation and that's the only one I use for the kernel modules as well. Oh, okay, okay. Even with Fujitsu compiler with the pragmas, so I experimented like two months back with the that time's latest compiler you needed to hack to, uh, to get the sector cache working. <laughs> yeah, so it was not pretty straight. So Chris, Chris, did you have some numbers? Uh, what is uh, barrier time with and without? Yes, uh, I, hardware barrier? 
Yes, I have it. So there, there is this advanced slide, so you can refer it uh, afterwards. So let's see where it is. I'm sharing it right now, so you should see it. Okay, then I'm not in. So do you see this hardware barrier slide? Yes, now I see. Yeah, we do now. Okay, so this is the cost of the barrier versus number of active cores with um, hardware barrier versus um, active weighting, so software-based barrier. And you see especially, well, the hardware barrier only works within one CMG. Beyond one CMG, it's, it's software-based. But within the CMG, you, you save a huge amount of cycles, okay? Like uh, it takes 500 cycles or something compared to over 3,000 with a software barrier. And then this translates to an, a corresponding speed up on the full, on the full A64FX. So if for small problems, if the barrier overhead is really your problem, then this may help a lot. Interesting. Right. You know, maybe Georg, you could show the sector cash benefit like for SPMV, like this one. For, moderate cash, uh, for moderate sizes of SP uh, metrics, you see some benefit from sector cash. So blue is uh, sector cash off and orange is sector cash on for different matrices. I think this is also from the paper, right? It's, it's in the paper. Right. Yeah. And and how are you actually? I mean, the soft, the sector cache as I understand it is basically you're you're controlling the the policy, and you can almost use it as software managed cache. How, how are you yeah. actually using it? So basically, what you do is you allocate two sectors. Like for SPMV, for example, if you have a matrix and a vector, matrix normally don't have any reuse, right? But vector can have potential reuse. So the blue, oh yeah, this one. Uh, so basically what you do is you allocate a small sector. So you can uh, use pragma for that and you can allocate, okay, I tell, okay, I allocate two ways, for example, for metrics. So two ways of the cache for the metrics. And basically I think the cache has 14 ways. So the rest of the two, uh, the rest 12 ways goes for the vector. And this means the vector uh, enjoys a bigger space than the metrics in the cache. So okay, yeah, right. right. Okay. Well, I mean, I I think we should uh, first off everyone thank uh, the entire team for such an amazing presentation that we know very well it took an enormous amount of work and time to put together. So thank you very much indeed. So I'll turn my camera on while I'm clapping. So I'm back visible. Again. Welcome. We actually enjoyed putting this all together. Give us an opportunity to look at things also from different angles and to look at a new machine as well. And especially Thomas had a lot of headache with liquid on the machine that is somehow got it running. Okay, well, very good. I mean, uh, and to some extent in these headaches, uh, new discoveries to be made sometimes. So. Um, yeah, and, exactly. Uh, very good. And I must say that I think these tools uh, are things we're going to be using on a regular basis. Uh, as I, uh, I think it was maybe Thomas indicated in his presentation, it, it's, uh, it's sort of like a, it's not a Swiss army knife. It's a, it's a set of tools and you can pick up the right tool for the right job. Correctly. Yeah. yeah. Like Unix philosophy, use one tool for one task. Also, we warn people that these tools are actually, it's possible with these tools to generate an enormous amount of data. So people, some people are inclined to wrap these tools in, in scripts and then run their code with different configurations, different data taking options, and then you get gigabytes of data. And then what do you do with that? Okay, you throw machine learning on it? Oh, I don't know, okay? That's not our approach, okay? We look at I know you saw the presentation by Jan Laukemann about Osaka. We look at 10 lines of code for two months and make, try to make sense of that. <laughs> right. okay. This is our, <laughs> our approach. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we have, uh, we certainly don't have people who are at the, the sort of uh, focused on the algorithmic uh, auto tuning level thing, but uh, we do have people at both ends of the spectrum, uh, people with large loops that are essentially black boxes and we want to peer inside. And then again, the, the small kernel. So I, I already have some uh, small matrix transpose uh, times matrix kernels that we want to tune for a, a spectral element code. And uh, I, I can see these tools are useful for that. 
But one thing with A64FX, if you look at large loops, is that large on this process is actually quite small. So the out of order processing capabilities are quite limited, which means a kernel which still can be overlapped quite effectively within the pipelines using speculative execution, out of order execution on an Intel processor or AMD processor is really hitting the limits of latency on the A64FX. And you're seeing the full critical path in the worst mm -hmm. case, very early, even with kernels that are no problem on Intel CPUs. That's one of the big problems of this architecture. Yeah, we certainly see that. Okay, very good. Well, uh, Ava, back to you. I don't think there is much more to say other than thank you very much, Georg, um, Thomas, Christy, and Jan. It was really great seeing that and took a little bit longer, but I think it was worth it. And Absolutely. most people stayed for, for this half an hour, for this additional half an hour. So thank you very much. And yeah, let's stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.